fascinating documentary series, six episodes, and it's about the lives of legendary actors Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. He told us all about their love story in Studio 1A. That's coming up. Plus, we spoke to the cast of Rutherford Falls about Native joy and telling Native American stories. And later, we're going to close things out on the show today. We've got a glimpse at a 12-year-old Daniel Radcliffe as he was just adjusting to newfound Harry Potter fame. All that coming up. But first, here's today's Pop Star Headlines. First up, Steven Spielberg. We tease that the legendary director known for bringing Hollywood's most iconic stories and sweeping landscapes to life on the big screen recently took on a much more intimate project for the very first time in his career. Steven Spielberg directed a music video and he released the project yesterday with Mumford and Sons singer Marcus oh. Mumford. Wow. Now they shot the video earlier this month in a New York City high school gym. Spielberg's wife, Kate Capshaw, is credited as the producer, art director, and dolly grip. <laughs> the song's called Cannibal. Let's take a look. It's a razor thin line between genius and, I mean, that could be Us. a kid, right? <laughs> on an iPhone, but yeah. that's Steven Spielberg. On a rolling show. Because he's not doing music video. That oh. song is fantastic, too. Right. Marcus Mumford opening up about this insane career milestone when he wrote on social media. When people get it, it blows my mind. Kate and Steven just got it, and I can't thank wow. them cool. enough. Cool. Okay, yeah. Pretty cool. Now an exclusive reveal in Popstart this morning. Today's launching a brand new digital cover series, and who better to help us reveal this debut edition than our inaugural cover star herself, Isa. Here. By the way, we haven't seen it. Let's drum roll, please. Oh, yes. Let's Fuck. debut the. Oh, there it is. Oh, yes. I'm Look at sorry. You. And it's in motion. It it's is so beautiful. Tell us about doing this cover shoot. Mm. This cover, like, I hadn't done uh, any photo shoots in like six months. So we ended, yeah. or probably longer. We ended mm -hmm. the show in December, and mm -hmm. this was such an amazing experience. We got to shoot it in a house outside in the beautiful mm. uh, LA weather. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you know, the photographer, shout out to her, she just killed Oof. it. So Congrats on Insecure, by the way, is the show, if people don't know. It was fantastic. Thank it was you. a big yeah. 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 I know. Thank I, was, you. I was just telling Hoda this morning, I've never seen anything like this. It almost reminded me, the, the writing is beautiful, the, the, the pictures, mm. and as you're scrolling and reading the art, Article, you see these videos and these in the motion. Photo shoot. It's, just, it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's cool. And well, you, thank y'all for making me your first cover. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. you open up really yeah. personally mm -hmm. in this. I mean, it, it, it's really unusual for you. What you, you know, to do Sylvia with is one of those interviewers who just is like talking to your girlfriend. So mm -hmm. she caught me a couple moments, <laughs> giving a little too much. So, you know, a couple hours later, her. you're like, what did I yeah, say? What did I, say? I, I wasn't even drinking. drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to be joining us a little later on the fourth hour to talk yeah. some more. Isa, we're so happy that you're here. Congratulations. Wait, is this your first anniversary coming up of your marriage? You know, it is. It oh, is. Wow. Happy yeah, anniversary. Year. Year. Thank year. you. Yeah. That and happy a billion projects. Yeah. yeah, I made it. That's that's one project on in and of itself. <laughs> you can read the full story, by the way, today.com. And we have some more headlines for you, including Harry Styles. Remember when the golden singer rocked our plaza back in May? It was so much fun to have him here. Well, I hope you were taking diligent notes when he was here, because next spring, Texas State University is going to offer a course all about Harry Styles. That's right. Pretty soon, students at the university are going to be up late night talking about cramming for their Harry Styles finals. That's right. Professor Louis Dean Valencia is scheduled to introduce the new class exploring all things about Harry's music and the impact that he's had on the modern celebrity on today's culture. So, Professor Louis, feel free to add this Pop Star Plus to your syllabus. And for what inspired this, the Texas State staffer told our Austin affiliate that he's been a big fan of Harry since his One Direction days. By the way, this continues that trend of pop stars leading the college course catalog. You might remember earlier this year, NYU launched a class about Taylor Swift. Look, this is one way to get kids to go to class, that's for sure. All right, next up, The Great British Bake Off. On your marks, get set, musical? Yeah, it's happening. The beloved UK baking show is headed to the stage. Bake Off, the musical, set to make its debut across the pond next week. Based on the famously friendly competition show, audiences will recognize the show's endlessly overheated great white tent. Plus, it's going to feature the types of Bake Off characters that we've all 
come to know and love, especially Savannah Guthrie. The surprisingly young superstar. There's the grandparent with decades of experience. Uh, how about the quirky baker who steps outside the lines? Now we just need to know if there's a song about soggy bottoms or a ballad for Paul Hollywood's coveted handshakes. All that you'll figure out. Bake Off, the musical, scheduled to run from July 22nd. Again, this is over the pond to August 6th. And there you have it. The latest that you'll need to know, at least for today. Still to come, Ethan Hawke opens up about his new docuseries. It's really fascinating. Bringing recordings, actual recordings of icons Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward to life. Stay with us. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Are you tell us what, what it was like? Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. Ethan Hawke's latest project centers on the partnership between actors Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward that includes a star-studded list of actors who read transcripts of real interviews. Earlier today, Ethan stopped by Studio 1A to tell us all about it. Newman and Joanne Woodward were two Hollywood icons who shared a rare 50-year marriage. Their real-life story just as captivating as the decades of performances in movies and TV and on Broadway. Well, Ethan Hawke. Ethan Hawke is the director behind the epic six-part series, The Last Movie Stars. It uses transcripts from lost Paul Newman interviews, and it illustrates the couple's incredible story. He casts some major A-listers to narrate the project, including George Clooney as Paul Newman. Take a listen. The glue that held Joanne and me together was that anything seemed possible. With all other people, some things were possible, but not everything. The promise of everything was there in the very beginning. Okay, uh, Ethan, welcome in. This project is so unique and epic, I feel like. You had a treasure trove of interviews that came from transcribed tapes. And basically, the Newman family, Newman's daughter, came to you and said, here's, here's my parents, please make something with all this. I know, it, it felt like a giant responsibility. I mean, I really was desperate to say no. Yeah. You, you know, because I knew how much work it would be and what a huge responsibility it would be. But I'm too much of a sucker. I'm, I'm a romantic, and I've, I grew up loving and adoring them. And I felt like people were kind of forgetting about what a miracle they were, what amazing artists they were. They lived substantive lives. They were good citizens um, mm -hmm. of the world and the community. They took care of each other. And it felt like a great moment to say, no, it can be done. It you know, can It be can done. be done. We can love each other. We can take care of each other. We can live good lives. And we can have a great time while we're doing it. Well, we learned so many things in this. Number one, when everyone thinks of the two of them, we think of Paul Newman as the big star. But that wasn't how it started, was it? He was her, her boy toy boyfriend at the beginning. You know, I mean, she was she won the Oscar. She was heralded as you know Hollywood's shining light. Three Faces of Eve blew the world away. Yeah. As you know, as a young woman, and it took him a little 
longer to find his stride. Mm -hmm. You know, but shortly after they married, then the hustler came out and his career broke and then he blew up. You know what I love about this? Because we hear about the love story of Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward, and you actually hear it in their own words. I mean these are these are tapes. They'd done lots of audio tapes that were transcribed. Yeah, they were Newman was trying to write a memoir, and so uh -huh. he and Joanne hired their best friend who's named Stuart Stern, who he wrote Rebel Without a Cause and a lot of great movies, and he was a really close family friend, and they did interviews with everybody in Paul and Joanne's life. And then Paul abandoned the memoir and abandoned the tapes, but I had, they, had they had them transcribed. So I got my actor friends to read some of these, uh, to reenact these interviews. Wow. And I built the, basically the spine of the documentary is all these lost interviews of their closest friends talking about them. I thought what was fascinating about the memoir that Paul Newman was thinking about was I didn't realize that Paul Newman had been married before. Yeah. yeah. That he had a wife and a family yeah. when he met Joanne Woodward. Yeah. I didn't I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean a lot of people don't know that their this beautiful marriage was born out of you know from scandal. Yeah. You know, they you know, but Paul's generation, it was a tough time. I mean, he came back from World War II. Yeah. Uh, he, as soon as he arrived, he went to do a play in Summerstock and fell madly in love. Yeah. And before he knew it, he had three kids with somebody he didn't know very well, and he still was, he was running a sporting goods store. And then it, that wasn't his true self. He wanted to be an actor, and he wanted to be an artist. He moved the young family to New York. Met Joanne backstage. They were both understudies, you know, around the corner from here on, wow. uh, on Broadway. And his life changed so dramatically. It, it, it was unrealistic to think he was going to, that it, you know, that yeah. something like this couldn't happen. Something could like happen. this would happen. Yeah. When you think about him, he's known for those piercing blue eyes and that sex appeal. But it's funny that he didn't think he was so sexy. Like we learned that. He says that, you know, Joanne created that image. And I really? think that what he means is, he respected her so much and her confidence in him uh. kind of taught him who he could be, her belief. And they did that for each other. You know, he directed her in many, many projects. He, I mean, they took turns nurturing each other. Um, you know, who was the rose and who was the gardener, uh -huh. so to speak. You know? Well, I thought it was fascinating, uh, Ethan, just how revealing Joanne was, revealing in those tapes about her reluctance to have children. She didn't think movie stars made good moms. Yeah. And she said the words aloud. I know, we're not allowed wow. to say things yeah. like that, even though we all think it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. But I felt if an actor was gonna make a movie about actors, that we needed to tell the truth. And I think that Joanne, when she talks about parenting that way, she loved her children and she loved being a mother to them. But I, my interpretation of her going all this is that she really wanted to remind young women what it was that they, they were giving up. That, that, you know, her life, she got strong-armed mm -hmm. into a certain lane. Yeah. You know, her whole dreams of being the movie star that Paul got to be were, they were really pushed aside. And that's what society does to a lot of young women. She was warning them, hey, before you go gonzo in love, be, be, <laughs> make sure you know what you're doing. And I think the end of their life was fascinating that she had dementia, he, he had cancer, and yet in the, in the end, you know, she, she was distant from him because she didn't, I guess, you know, she was in that different state, but she ended up going to him in the end, uh, as, as her their daughter described, and seeing him take his last breath. It's so beautiful. Um, it's, you know, death and illness is, is always strikes us as, as sad. And what this movie, what I really wanted to do is focus on their life. Yes. It's a life well lived and their life together in their 70s was the best part time of their wow. life. She's running a theater company. Yeah. She's really her fully realized version of herself. They're giving away hundreds of millions of dollars. He's doing Color of Money, Verdict, Nobody's Fool, some of the best work yes. in his life. And when you think, you know, right around the corner from here was is the actor's studio. <laughs> and Paul Newman, Joanne Woodward were in class there with James Dean, Marlon Brando, Marilyn Crazy. Monroe. And when you look at their peers in their 70s yeah. were not yes. in full blossom the yeah. way Paul and Joanne were. Well, Ethan, this is an incredible project. It is unique. It's all by itself. You have George Clo Clooney, uh, Lara Linney, and so many others. Congratulations on this. We encourage people to check it out. Yeah, I'm grateful to all my friends for helping. I'm so grateful. Oh, thanks, thanks for having me on your show. Oh, you can check out all the episodes of The Last Movie Stars. It's streaming this Thursday on HBO Max.
That's such a cool concept. Great to have Ethan here with us telling us all about it. You can catch The Last Movie Stars on HBO Max on July 21st. Coming up next, Ed Helms and the rest of the Rutherford Falls cast on how the show tackles representation. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on yes. this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. Rutherford Falls chronicles the goings-on in a small northeastern town that borders a Native American reservation. The show's been getting touted as a, being very breakthrough in its representation on camera and behind the scenes with six Native writers. And the cast spoke to us about why their storytelling is so important. Rutherford Falls, in a nutshell, is... It's a small northeastern town with some kind of uh, colonial pride that exists on the border of the fictional Minashanka Reservation. The communities interact with each other, and they work together, and they have conflicts as well. The show kind of dives into the politics behind whose land is whose and who founded the town. I think it is something where it's like there's a wonderful small town comedy, but within that there's incredible themes of revisionist history and uh, native joy and uh, reclaiming identity and redefining identity. Uh, it's a really, it, it, there's a lot of complex themes, uh, but that just gets delivered in a palatable, lighthearted, hilarious and heartfelt comedy. A bunch of years ago, Lawrence Rutherford wrote and signed a legally binding agreement with the Minnesota. That's why this town exists. That's why all of you exist. Okay, Lawrence Rutherford is our forefather. He's our Adam and Eve, our, our Tigris and Euphrates. And that statue, which sits on my family's land, commemorates all that he gave us. And if you don't get that, well, you're just an ungrateful boob. Yeah. I think in season one, we, you know, explored the Nathan character and this concept of his legacy. We kind of blow it up by the end of the of the season. And you also watch characters like Terry and Regan really level up and get what they've been sort of fighting for for many, many years. And so in season two, it's a real kind of fun exploration of what does it feel like when you're starting from scratch and you have to kind of build a legacy for yourself. And then also what happens when you do have it all and get what you want. And is that sometimes harder than, than having to start over again. Um, we really leaned into the ensemble. I feel like we really got to explore and find out how funny these characters are and different dynamics that we enjoyed and dynamics we hadn't tried yet. And so it's a real sort of, there's a lot of romance and a lot of silliness this year and I'm just really excited for people to see it. I think that um, comedy is inviting. To generate laughter for people is 
a gift. I think also, you know, specifically for Native people and Native storylines, we have been relegated to drama historically in this industry. And so it's been actually very fun and easy to elevate us into a, a comedy space and to utilize the, the writing of other Native comedians and non-Native comedians. I always think of this quote from Judd Apatow where he said, when someone's laughing, it's the only time I'm sure that they don't hate me. <laughs> and so, or something like that. I might have butchered it a little bit, but it speaks to a greater beauty and truth about comedy and especially comedic storytelling, which is you can tell stories about awful characters or characters that make awful mistakes. And Nathan certainly is that and Regan is that mm -hmm. at times. And uh, and if but if you're keeping the audience laughing, then they're also kind of empathizing and they're also connecting and they're not hating that that character for making these mistakes. And that's, I think, a very powerful thing that that without articulating it that clearly, we have sort of we have strived for in making Rutherford Falls. One of the details that I love this season, I mean, the show in general is so great and it's, you know, it's it's Sierra uh, spearheading, obviously, but all of the, the writers, there's uh, six Native writers on the staff and all of them as well, like, are reaching out to their communities to bring in art from their various communities and just sort of connections that they have. As an Indigenous actor, you know, frankly, you know, as, a, as an actor of color, I think Hollywood positions us to be sort of, in a way, guardians of, of cultural authenticity. With Rutherford Falls, I was placed in a position where I didn't have to do that. The writing was authentic. The writing came from our communities. So that allowed me to sort of just really be a better actor, to be very clear. All the success, you know, that I've had, um, you know, as an actor being recognized for my work on season one came because uh, Sierra and the rest of the creators uh, were, were shouldering the load. Um, carrying things uh, that would allow Jana and myself and the other the other Indigenous actors to really um, just level up. Uh, so I'm I'm so grateful for that. I feel like when it comes to Native um, stories on television that's made by non-Native people, there's usually an element of like hold for applause, or it just feels like homework, and you're just like, oh god. And I we like we always were like let's avoid Ugh, kind of feeling, you know, at, at every turn. And, and so in our lives um, as Native storytellers, I find that often very complex things will happen to us and they'll be coupled with comedy. And I always was like, if we could just tell our story as we experience it, I think people will not only get a real view into our experience, but they'll also be very entertained and will find it funny. Once Native people are in on the joke, it's, it's a really wonderful experience for, for any viewer coming into the show. Well, it is important. That was awesome to hear from those folks. We should mention Rutherford Falls is available on Peacock, which is part of our parent company, NBC Universal. Still to come from our vault, Daniel Radcliffe at just 12. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. And welcome back. Daniel Radcliffe's 33rd birthday is this week, so we thought it'd be a good idea to take a little journey back in time. To the very start of Daniel's career, he spoke with us at Today during the release of the very first Harry Potter film when Daniel was just 12 years old.
Hi, Dan. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Well, let's talk about the whirlwind your life has been recently. Yesterday was the premiere here in the Big Apple. A week before that was the London premiere. Red carpets, flashing lights, entertainment reporters. I mean, what was it like? It was pretty scary, but it was... It was pretty scary, but it was really good fun. And everybody there, like Chris Columbus, he was there, and he just makes you feel like really at ease. Was it exciting, though, just oh, to yeah. kind of finally, I mean, this was the product of n nine long months of very hard work, frankly, by you and the rest of the cast and everybody involved in the picture. So it must have been just wonderful to kind yeah. of have the weight off your shoulders and be able to sort of have a good time. It was, yeah, it was fun. but. I, I was quite nervous, but it was it was very cool. You were nervous really about nervous. how the movie would be received, or just um, all the attention. I I was kind of just nervous about like seeing all the um, photographers and everything like that. I was kind of nervous about that. Yeah, the paparazzi yeah. they can be a little overwhelming. I'm sure, especially for someone who's 11 years old. You're still 11, um, or 12. 12. When did 12. you turn 12? Uh, July 23rd. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's my daughter's birthday. Happy birthday. Mm. Anyway, let's go back because I know that at first. I feel it right now, Dan, as you must understand, I feel like the official Harry Potter historian slash Warner Brothers flack. But having said that, I know all the, the whole story and I know your backstory, which was there two months before shooting, there was no Harry Potter. Thousands of kids had auditioned. And the director, Chris Columbus, said, get me that kid from David Copperfield, right? Tell me how they discovered you and why they went after you uh, so enthusiastically to play Harry Potter. I have no idea. Well, obviously, they, yeah. they're pretty captivated by your performance in David Copperfield. Um, I really don't know why they chose me, but I'm glad they did. And so, at first, your yeah. parents weren't that enthusiastic, right? Um, they only had one concern, and that was because um, I've been up for David Copperfield, and I've been up for Taylor of Panama, and on both of those, I, I kind of had a tendency to get my hopes up and they knew that there were thousands of boys going up for the part so they didn't want me to get my hopes up and then be disappointed so they were just protecting me. And they were though, once you did get the part, they were pretty excited as yeah. you were too. Well, uh, and when you, I know that when you were first tapped <laughs> to play <laughs> Harry Potter, uh, you hadn't read the books. But after you got the role, you quickly devoured them and fell in yeah. love with them like so many other oh, kids. What was it about the books that you found so great? I think... I think it was the fact that I think not only myself, but I think everybody can relate to Harry in some way. And I think as well, it's the idea of magic when magic kind of comes to life there's so much opportunity for absolutely anything to happen so and I think I kind of like to read about what could happen if magic really came to life. And Harry Potter in a way is sort of the ultimate underdog I mean you really mm -hmm. push for him because he his lot in life is pretty tough uh, in fact we have a clip uh, this is where Harry Potter we see he has a very sad life living under the stairs in his mean aunt and uncle's house the Dursleys <laughs> they sound mean the Dursleys they mean, don't they, they? Yeah. and he starts to realize he has special wizard powers let's take a quick look at a clip excuse me could, could you tell me how to how to get onto the platform? <laughs> Not to worry, dear. It's Ron's first time to Hogwarts as well. Now, all you've got to do is walk straight at the wall between platforms 9 and 10. Best do it at a bit of a run if you're nervous. Good luck. Hogwarts Express. That's not the Dursleys at all, Dan. I'm so sorry. Anyway, you did a great job as Harry Potter. I know you're yes. already shooting the second film. Yeah. The first one opens this Friday. Thanks so much for coming by. Great to see you <laughs> again, you. Dan. We appreciate it. And a happy early birthday to you, Mr. Radcliffe. And there you have another Popstar Plus comes to an end. We hope you'll join us again tomorrow. We're going to have more things that you're going to need to know. Until then, have a great day. See you soon.
Hello and welcome to our Today All Day special, Cracking the Case, America's Obsession with True Crime. I'm Gotti Schwartz and we're at Othram Labs in Houston for an incredible story we're gonna get to later in our show. But first, we set the scene. Why is it that our society is so obsessed with true crime? Let's take a deeper look. We have a kidnapping. Hurry, please. Explain to me what's going on, okay? There, we have a, there's a note left and our daughter's gone. From John JonBenet Ramsey and O.J. Simpson, started yelling, he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me. I said, well, who, who is going to kill you? She said, OJ. To Natalie Holloway and Gabby Petito. Justice for Gabby is that we see justice for her homicide. True crime has captivated audiences for years with no end in sight. An explosion of true crime content on television with shows like Dateline and Tiger King, leaving viewers transfixed and searching for more. In fact, audience demand for true crime has grown more than 73% in the documentary streaming space. But the largest platform? Podcasts, where 62 million Americans a year listen to deep dives of intricate cases. I think there's something about these cases that feels unfinished. We want to try and understand why it happened. For Ashley Flowers, an interest turned into a true crime empire started by her podcast, Crime Junkie. I was always what I now call a crime junkie. Making it a career was a totally different journey, and I wanted to find a way to actually start making a difference and not just listen or read these stories. True crime's impact close to home for Kim Goldman, who experienced the death of her brother, Ron Goldman, in the public eye. My brother's case is still relevant today because it was the first opportunity that we had to peek inside a courtroom to understand how money and celebrity and race plays a part. And with the internet being what it is and social media being what it is, it allows the new generation, the younger generation to peek in again and it just drums up a tremendous amount of energy. Goldman recently launched a new podcast, Media Circus, to hear the stories of victims. Having been the subject of a high profile case for so long, I was first in line to see how mistruths and rumors and conspiracies and negativity can be incredibly damaging to the, the healing process and to grief. Others are turning to social media like TikTok to amplify cases. I got into true crime TikTok because I wanted to see people of my skin tone being represented. I wanted to be one of the first. Kimberly Chapman, also known as True Crime Kimberly, has amassed over 800,000 followers for her takes on captivating cases. It's just mind blowing how people can, can commit such crazy acts and get away with it. I just want to know what's going through those people's head when they're doing those things. What started as one hot take became a TikTok phenomenon. From that video, it really just took off and the comments was filled with people saying, talk about this person and talk about that and I have a missing person that I want you to talk about. But what's behind this American obsession with true crime? We ask psychologist Shavana Childs. We deep dive into it so that we can get the whole picture. We want to know how this person ticks. We want to know what was behind the story. It's a look into their deeper lives. Women are particularly interested in true crime because it becomes a template of what not to do, of how to save themselves should they find themselves in similar situations. We want to know that we can survive. And is there such a thing as too much true crime? Dr. Childs warns psychological impacts can occur. If you find that you're losing sleep, if you find that you're isolating from your friends, if you find that you're nervous in situations that you typically wouldn't be because you've been watching true crime, it might be time to pull back. But the public's interest in true crime doesn't look like it's slowing down, impacting lives across the world. I think the future of true crime media is figuring out how we can do it in the most ethical way possible. And I think that is ensuring that we're working in tandem with, with victims, with law enforcement, making sure, most importantly, that we're not re-traumatizing victims and their families by telling these stories. If people like myself are going to operate in the true crime space, then we need to find a way to give back. And I think that is going to be a lot more mainstream coming in the future. You might know actress Marisol Nichols from the show Riverdale, but far from the glitz and glamour of Hollywood, Nichols has assumed a role of a lifetime, a real-life undercover operative working to end human trafficking. In her acting career spanning nearly three decades, Marisol Nichols has played detectives, Freeze! Hands in the air! principals, Okay, I won't suspend her if you do me one favor. And CEOs. I have a ton of work to do. Come with me. 
comedy where? She's best known for her work on hit show Riverdale. Your disrespect will no longer be tolerated. Not by me and certainly not by your father when he comes home. But it's her role out of the spotlight she's most proud of. It's described as an undercover operative. What does that mean? I'm literally undercover pretending to be someone else into a situation where we're infiltrating different scenarios. As a licensed informant, Nichols helps crack down on human trafficking, a $150 billion industry that involves labor and sexual exploitation. One in four victims of modern slavery are children, according to the International Labor Organization. Leaning on her acting prowess, Nichols has posed as just about everything to lure perpetrators in, even a young child as seen here. What was going through your mind in that first operation? I'll never forget this one guy. He's like, hey, kiddo. And I wanted to just like, you want to reach through the phone and just annihilate this person. And you can't because I need to, I need to make this guy and these men come out of hiding who have done this so many times and are used to doing this by the way. And I need them to show up because I've got a room full of law enforcement with semi-automatic weapons in the room next to me. And they're waiting to take these guys down and get them off the street. The 48 year old partners with police, district attorneys, governments and nonprofits like Operation Underground Railroad, founded by former special agent Tim Ballard. And when I met him, I was like, I've been looking for you because I'm I go, it's great to wait, raise awareness and that's wonderful. But I want to know who's getting the kids, like who is going out there and like rescuing these people is is anyone doing this? And I was like, that's the guy. That introduction proved to be pivotal, pushing Nichols to the front lines of rescue operations that have led to the arrest of dozens of people. Being so close to this, this is dark stuff. Very. How do you cope? It's, it's, I'm not going to lie. It's, <laughs> I don't come home normal. Some of the things that I've done have brought me to very dark, dark, dark places on the planet. But then I go, if my kid was taken and that was my kid, I would hope to God that someone else would risk their life for her. The risks are not lost on Nichols. She's a 13 year old daughter at home and thinks of her often ahead of operations, which can get messy. Was there ever a moment where you're like, oh, should I be doing this? Is this too risky? A hundred percent. The last one I did, I wrote a letter to my kid because it was pretty dangerous. And I'm like, if I don't come back from this, I don't want her to be mad that I died saving someone else's kid, essentially. So I wrote a letter to her to explain to her like why I was doing this. Nichols says as a survivor of sexual assault in her adolescence, the mission is personal for her. And I got raped a bunch by a bunch of guys. And it, it was pretty traumatizing. I woke up in the police department. I didn't know what happened. To this day, I don't remember much. Years later, Nichols leaned on the Church of Scientology to pull her away from drugs and improve her mental health. We pressed her on recent accusations in a lawsuit of trafficking within the church. Accusations the church denied in a statement to NBC News, saying in part, the allegations are both scurrilous and ridiculous, and the lawsuit is both a sham and scam. Has that ever given you pause? Uh, no, not in the least. It's so absurd, and for me, I know what I've seen. I know what I've experienced in Scientology. It saved my life. She's set to take a deep dive of the ups and downs in her life and volunteer work in a new podcast released this month. What's your hope? What's your goal for your efforts? My goal is to have enough good people know about this so that they demand an end to it. Still to come, celebrity medium Tyler Henry and mom Teresa share their personal true crime story in their first sit-down interview. And later, how this forensic lab is working to make cold cases obsolete. Stay with us. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Let's go. This is a crazy 
So many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. If you've read the news, odds are you've seen coverage of true crime cases, but most of that coverage seems to spotlight missing and murdered white women. Jennifer Buckley is working to change that. Take a look. Jennifer Buckley carefully applies red paint to her hand. The paint is symbolic. It speaks of violence, of silence, and resilience. It's art intended to have an impact, to awaken a state and a continent to the tragedy of missing and murdered indigenous women. I think collectively it just doesn't seem like our indigenous lives are as important as some others. It doesn't matter if it's on the reservation, off the reservation. Um, when people go missing, they're not looked for the same way. Missoula, Montana County Attorney Kirsten Pabst. It's an epidemic. It is a huge problem in Montana. Our missing persons when you look at the numbers 25 to 30 percent of our missing persons are native they only make up about six to seven percent of our population there are issues of jurisdiction whose problem tribal or municipal and state local or even federal law enforcement what do you think the roots of it are i think you have to go back hundreds of years to colonization and um, cultural degradation cultural degradation of our native american cultures and you combine that with this um, surge of methamphetamine and domestic violence that we're seeing today we're to the point now where we have to do something different for an epidemic mostly unnoticed and rarely publicized that something different fell to jen buckley who is an enrolled member of the Chippewa Cree tribes out of Rocky Boy, Montana. I just came up with a, well, maybe I'll just see if anybody wants to get their picture taken with the red handprint on their face to raise awareness. So that's how it started. One of the first places the photos landed was in the office of the county prosecutor. It's so powerful because, not only because of the intense and beautiful images, but you almost also capture the isolation visually as well. But so many of um, the murdered and missing women face. When you decided to put these up in your office, I mean, it just speaks volumes to you guys. You know what I mean? You putting these up is such a platform, and it just was really humbling. Jen, though, began to dream bigger much bigger. I just started to think, like, what is a large scale thing that people see that they have to see? And it, it, I just like, I don't know, there's billboards. Lamar Billboards donates the space, but Jen and her project are on a shoestring budget. I can raise the $200, it's up for a month, and then it comes down because I, I gotta wait till I have the, the next $200 to put it back up. Funded by the sales of her photos, the occasional donation, Jen has bigger dreams. My hope is definitely that I can get them up permanently, not only in Montana, but through the United States and into Canada. It's needed because too often the attention goes elsewhere. Just look at that white female that went missing from New York that was found dead in Wyoming and how much national exposure she got. Was it Gabby? And how many Native American females went missing in that same time period and there was nothing, so. Not a blip. Veteran Missoula police detective Guy Baker those billboards are a great way to bring awareness to this very important issue and uh, you know how many thousands of people driving by them every day see it so Jen has done a, a good job of kind of making it a personal issue that yeah. people can relate to important to detective Baker because maybe a billboard will help him solve a case he's worked on for years the missing Jermaine Charlo Jermaine is the niece sister of Alinda Morjo who volunteered to be photographed by Jennifer Buckley. The work Jennifer is doing is important. I'm hoping that her work 
reaches outside of Montana that we can get billboards in New York all the way down to Texas and up into Canada. This, this is crisis and it needs to stop. How is it for you to know your sister has been gone these years now? It's, it's been extremely hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever been through. Maybe this could make a difference. It will. It will. I know it will. Coming up, celebrity medium Tyler Henry and his mom, Teresa, reveal their very own, very personal true crime mystery. She shares her story of kidnap, being raised by serial killers, and much more after the break. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? It's a can't miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation? Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Reality television star Tyler Henry is known for his spot-on psychic readings, helping celebrities, and even working with law enforcement to solve cold cases. But now he's speaking out about a cold case that is very close to his heart. Take a look. How many R names can you think of in the family? Two. Okay. Because they are referencing the two R's. It keeps coming up. As Tyler Henry was finding fame as the star of E's Hollywood Medium, helping celebrities communicate with their loved ones from beyond the grave, even helping detectives and investigators solve cold cases. His own mother, Teresa Colwyn, was coping with a dark secret of her own. Three years ago, my mom discovered that she was taken as a baby. Before then, Teresa believed her mother was Stella Guidry Nessel, a career criminal who murdered and tortured two people in the Central Valley Motel. I still just can't come to terms with that part. I mean, it's one thing to murder someone, but to torture them. I think one of the important things we learned in this is really just the intergenerational effect of trauma. Stella's crimes devastating the lives of not only her victim's family, but Teresa's own family too. This traumatic history revisited in Tyler's Netflix series, Life After Death. So your middle name was Weva, but this has you down as Java. So I know my birth certificate yeah. has been doctored. Teresa learning Stella was not her birth mother, her birth mother, now deceased, had been tricked by Stella. The exact circumstances still unknown. And she raised me and used me in a way that she needed to benefit herself. The series capturing Teresa's emotional reunion with her biological family. My feelings um, when I met with my biological family were actually bittersweet as well, because while I loved them and adored them immediately, they're just wonderful, wonderful people. I also felt a loss because I felt like, well, what if I had been able to be raised with them? 
Ironically, Tyler says his psychic abilities weren't able to reveal much about those closest to him. Really for me, my process has to not be impeded by logic or by information. And so because it's me, because I have my own feelings and thoughts and expectations, that bias basically prevented me from being able to kind of connect intuitively. It was surreal, he says, to be on the other side of the reading for the first time. I felt like the tables kind of turned in the sense that I found myself in a very vulnerable position in a pursuit for answers. So I felt myself really feeling a sense of desperation. And I think it taught me and gave me an insight into closure. It's not really something you achieve as much as it's something that you have to kind of grow through and find acceptance around. For Teresa, the revelations brought an emotional release. Because I know I'm not related to her and I'm not like her. I know I'm a good person. But also raised new questions about the nature of family. It made me happy that Tyler doesn't have a grandmother who's a murderer. And the bittersweet part of that is that while she, it means that she's not my biological mother, it also means that my siblings that I love so much are not my biological siblings, but it doesn't matter because we're always going to be close. We learn in this journey the importance of asking questions. If there's blind spot, follow There's a up. reason. There's a reason. There are entire generations of silence, and it's yeah. important to break that silence and that the truth really can set you free. And coming up, we take you behind the scenes of some of the technology solving hundreds of cold cases. Stay with us. Desire, deception, and a double cross. The seduction, a deadly love story only Dateline and Keith Morrison can tell. Listen to the full season now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Yeah, who's this? It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back and welcome to Authorum Labs. Since 2018, the technology in this lab has helped solve hundreds of cases. They've never let cameras in until now, and we've got the exclusive, we've got the exclusive first look on how they solve the otherwise unsolvable. This is no longer something you see on TV that solves some cases here or there. So all of these cases that we're looking at here, these are the unsolvable cases before you guys came along. Absolutely. Just outside of Houston, Othram Labs is solving the unsolvable. So when it comes to your laboratory, when it comes to your tech and legacy tech, what's the, what's the main difference? So we're taking this really challenging evidence that's historically been unusable for testing, and then we're enabling testing, and then we're doing that with hundreds of thousands of markers instead of, say, tens of markers of what you do in a traditional forensic test. The Othram team combines medical and genomic expertise to revolutionize how forensic DNA is processed. If you go to, like, one of those consumer DNA companies to learn about your ancestry, you spit in a tube, and, and you'll generate uh, about 1,000 nanograms of DNA. At Othram, like, we, we work off 0.1 nanograms. Put it in a, perspective, how small is it? How small are we talking? So the equivalent would be a 15 human cells. If I touch David's shoulder right now, I've left hundreds of cells right here. We were able to identify a perpetrator from a 32-year-old sex assault murder of a 14-year-old girl in Las Vegas with 0.12 nanograms of DNA left. The lab's run by husband and wife duo David and Kristen Middleman. He handles the science, she does the business. So I met David um, working on DNA together at Baylor College of Medicine 20 years ago, so we both have a science background and DNA background. Oh, so you guys met in the lab? We did. Um, I made um, 
blind mice and he cured them. So He cured the blind he mice? He did, and so I thought if he could do that, he'd probably fix any problem I create, so <laughs> I married him. The problem they're tackling now, America's backlog of cold cases. Experts estimate there are more than 250,000 unsolved murders in the country. We're often the last hope. Every time they give you that last bit of DNA or that last bit of evidence, that is someone's last chance of being identified. That is a family member's last chance of finding out what happened to their loved one and someone's last chance to get justice for what happened to the person that they lost. In 2018, we had noticed that several cases had been solved, the Golden State Killer, for example, using this type of technology, but but it was, it was from a bunch of different pieces, right? Correct, would... and you notice that not all cases were being solved, and it really isn't justice unless you can provide it and apply it to every case. And that's when David said, well, there's no process to do so. And so he said, I'm gonna build it. I'm gonna build a forensic lab of the future. Here we're building kind of a molecular library of that DNA. So we're getting many copies of it, breaking it up into itty bitty pieces, and each little piece is like a book in the library that describes some component of the information about that case. And what this is, is a, it's the most powerful sequencer on Earth. How often are you breaking cases like this? How often are you calling law enforcement and saying, hey, I think every we've day. got a hit? Every now, day. Now, every day. Every single one of the samples in here, these all represent people that, that have not been identified. Yeah, they, they either represent victims or suspects to crimes. And so there are, there are countless numbers of folks in here um, that have never been identified through traditional methods. In, in almost every case that we've run, we've returned information that's been useful to the investigation. So we've seen it all. We've worked on a body that was found in a sewage tank for, for decades. We've worked on remains from 1881. We have worked on um, burnt remains, charred remains, and these are things that weren't possible a few years ago. Making the impossible possible, helping families and law enforcement find answers like in the 1974 abduction and murder of 17-year-old Carla Walker took my whole family. We were still a close family, but it was, and I'm sure you hear this quite often, it was never the same. Dothram was able to process a tiny DNA sample from Carla's bra strap. I, I had to look up what a nanogram was. It was so small. Those results, along with some good detective work, led investigators to arrest Glenn McCurley in 2020. I got a call around near 6 o'clock p.m. And one of the investigating detectives said, well, we got him. And he told me Glenn Samuel McCurley. And I'd never heard that name. Glenn McCurley was sentenced to life in prison for Carla's murder last year. Othram tracks some of its successes on DNAsolves.com, where anyone can donate money to fund their work. We've raised over $400,000 from crowdfunds, from philanthropists, from people across the country that are just willing to help solve these investigations help clear some of these backlogs and help become sort of the model for how this would work if there was federal funding. But now for the first time ever, in a recent appropriations bill, Congress says it'll fund this type of forensic technology. With the work that you've done, what do you think forensics is going to look like in 10 years? So I think we'll live in a world where there are no backlogs. People don't have to wait decades to find out what happened to their loved one and perpetrators are caught the first time they commit a crime. So, so you, think that, you think that this could prevent crime in the future? I think it would become a deterrent for crime. I would definitely think twice. I think if you've left DNA at a crime scene, it's a matter of time before someone like us or us processes that crime scene. Thank you for joining us this half hour for Cracking the Case, America's obsession with true crime. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and see you next time on Today All Day. Ooh, the answer's calling, you need them most. Ooh, let it go. The Today Show's newest fan. This is the moment. Little Al Roker. What are you doing here? What am I doing here?
New York City is home to so many iconic foods. But when the city that never sleeps wakes up for breakfast, they want a bagel with a cream cheese schmear piled high with lots. There's no other city that makes a bagel like a New York City bagel. I have not had good bagels in any other city. I came out the wounds eating bagels. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. If New York's known for anything, it's its bagels. And we got them all. Everything bagels, rainbow bagels, pumpkin bagels, croissant bagels, and of course you can't have them without a schmear. While the bagel first came from Poland, many food historians say its pairing with salmon and cream cheese originated right here in the Big Apple. In this town, few specialty food shops are as beloved and as historic as Russ and Daughters. I've been waiting in line probably 15, 20 minutes, but it's definitely worth it. I like the, the contrast of the flavor. It's like a nice little bagel with a with salty locks. Something about the salmon and cream cheese together, like I try to make it at home, but it's nothing compared to Russ and Daughters. They've been serving premium smoked fish to hungry New Yorkers and folks from around the world for over 100 years. Just a few blocks from the store is the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Hi, Al. Hey, how are you? Welcome to the Russell Daughters Cafe. Nice to see it's you. It's great guys. to have you here. Thanks for having us. This is beautiful. Thank you. Nikki Russ Betterman and Josh Russ Tupper are the grandchildren of the original daughters. These cousins are fourth generation owners carrying on their family's culinary legacy. So, this is Russ and Daughters. Wow. This is our great grandfather, Joel Russ, who started the business his wife, Bella, and his three daughters. Um, we, Josh and I have the same grandmother, and she was the youngest of the three. Was it unusual at that time for, because you, you usually you'd see so-and-so and sons, yeah. but to see Russ and daughters. Very unusual. But I mean, honestly, if he had had sons, it probably would have been Russ and sons. Well, thank <laughs> goodness he did. We like exactly. to think of him as a feminist, but he was a good businessman. Joel Russ immigrated from Poland in 1907. And he started just standing on the streets of the Lower East Side selling schmaltz herring out of a barrel. And a family could feed itself for two nights with one fish. In 1914, he opened his first brick and mortar shop, J. Russ National Appetizing. Joel and his wife had three daughters, Patty, Ida, and Anne. When they turned 11, each daughter began working with their dad. What was their relationship like with him? I, because uh, he's your dad, but he's also your boss. your boss. Yeah, and I think he cared more about being the boss and the shopkeeper. He was a new immigrant to this country who was just trying to survive and make a place for his family. And that was his focus. And he saw his children as, as you know, cheap labor. <laughs> the sisters grew up learning all aspects of the business. In 1935, Hattie, Ida, and Anne became Joel's partners. The shop was renamed Russ and Daughters, making it the first in America to bear and daughters in its title. When your great-grandfather decided to, to start Russ and Daughters, why the Lower East Side? After Ellis Island, this was the starting off point for the majority of poor Jewish immigrants. This is where they landed and they got their start and so he was just feeding basic food to other poor immigrants like himself. At the turn of the century, this neighborhood was one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Many immigrants from all around the world lived in overcrowded tenement buildings, the conditions having a profound impact on their diets. One of the things about Lower East Side Jewish food is that a lot of food wasn't made at home. When you don't have running water or when you don't have uh, electric or gas stoves, it's really hard to do very much cooking. And so for, for women who are responsible for feeding their families, they had to get food from push carts, from restaurants, from bakeries. Joel Russ was one of many vendors catering to this new population. 
I've, I've always been curious, how did it come about, or from what you've heard, that somebody thought, hey, you know, here's this round bread, we'll put some fish on it, but oh, by the way, before we do, let's put some cream cheese, some dairy on it. Yeah. yeah. First of all, Ross and Daughters is the torchbearer of what's called appetizing. And this is a food tradition born here in New York, and it's the sister food tradition to delicatessen, both of which come up through the Jewish kosher dietary rules. You have to separate fish and dairy from meat. So a delicatessen, strictly speaking, is for meat. The appetizing store is where you go for fish and dairy, things like herring, smoked fish. When we say bagel and lox, most people are, you know, we're referring to a smoked salmon, but sure. the original bagel and lox was not with smoked salmon. Technically, lox, or belly lox, is salmon cured in salt, which preserves fish without refrigeration. There's no smoking involved, and it's incredibly salty, so it pairs perfectly with tangy cream cheese. But who was the first person to put lox on a bagel? So no one really knows how bagels, lox, and cream cheese all came together. We know that bagels come from Eastern Europe. We know that lox kind of comes basically from Nova Scotia, kind of. We know the cream cheese is an American food. But what we know is that these things come together as part of a compromise between different generations of American Jews. Jewish law prohibits cooking with most heat sources on the Sabbath. So the combo of bagels and lox created a filling meal for observant Jews to enjoy on the day of rest. It's good for a family, but you or your daughter-in-law didn't have to be spending the, the previous day cooking. As one of the country's oldest appetizing stores, Russ and Daughters has been serving kosher meals for generations. And the weekends are still their busiest days. I can't think really of th anything that's more New York than lox and bagels. I agree. I think that this is a food that came up through the Eastern European Jewish immigrants to New York. But now it's it transformed and just become New York food. It belongs to all New Yorkers. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody good, and that's it! Yeah. Valde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. In the United States, women own less than 20% of all businesses. At the iconic Russ and Daughters, co-owner Nikki Russ Betterman is building on the legacy of her grandmother and great aunts. Growing up, you, you follow in the footsteps of, of strong women who may not have chosen this, but took it on and obviously made it really successful. What is it like for you following in those footsteps? It's a tremendous feeling to be now the and great-granddaughter. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a good customer of ours. Her family came from the Lower East Side, and she once said that before she knew the word feminist, 
when she looked up at the sign, Russ and Daughter, she understood that women could have an impact. Your family's business, Russ and Daughter, has, has survived two world wars, a depression. Uh, you're here in the, the shadow of the World Trade Center. Yes. Why has this place been able to not just survive, but thrive? I think because in each generation there has been someone who wanted to do this. This is food that people turn to for comfort in hard times. And during the pandemic, we saw that you know, people were shipping Russ and Daughters all over the country to their loved ones because they couldn't be together. And so sending you know, bagels and lox and babka, say, you know, I love you, I miss you. Here, let me feed you. Having a schmear over Zoom. Oh, there was a lot of that. <laughs> Okay, so you can get smoked fish pretty much everywhere these days, but not quite like this. The salmon sold at Russ and Daughters is prized for its high fat content, from the milder Gaspe Nova to the smokier Scottish. And this gourmet fish is all sliced by hand. When you hold it up, I mean, it's it's almost Look at translucent. That. Yeah, I think we should show you how we get it that then. Yeah, me and a sharp utensil, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> It takes up to six months of training to master the slicing technique here. So Al, I hear you have some knife skills. Well, I've been in a fight or two, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, probably nothing like yours. So how, how long have you been slicing salmon? I've been at the store for 20 years. Wow. Um, so I've been slicing for a while. All right, so, so uh, I watch people slice and I, uh, I'm amazed at, at how patient, because it seems like that's part of the, the skill. The reality is when you know how to slice, mm -hmm. it is one of the most relaxing things you can do. Very zen. Very zen. Ooh. Meditative, right? Mm. The trick is don't look anywhere on the fish. You have to really feel the fish. Be the fish. Be the fish, which is a very difficult concept to train yeah, someone. Good. Um, and particularly the first couple slices are, mm. don't be upset okay. if they don't look great. The idea is to make a consistently thick slice. Are you making so, faces at me? Huh? No, I'm just watching you not watch the fish. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Be the fish. Not looking. You should, you should look. I should you look. You got a sharp knife in your hand, Al. And you can see that as you change the angle of the knife, it changes the thickness. Yeah. Right? So now that's Drastically, a very... Drastically, more than a, you think. That's more than... Oh my gosh, that's a very thick we call slice. call those chuletas. Chuletas? Yeah. Chops. Ah. In Spanish. I was going to say, that sounds that, that sound <laughs> Yiddish. Not, not that Yiddish. did not sound not Yiddish, Yiddish to me. No. Does the way you cut it affect the taste of it or the texture of it? The texture uh, affects the experience of the salmon. It's almost like you're eating the essence of salmon, not salmon. It's very delicate. It's a very appealing mm. texture and, and mouthfeel. Mm. Yeah, the thinner. Josh, thanks so much. Nice meeting you. Such a pleasure to have you. Ah, smoke them if you got them. Up next how fresh salmon gets turned into locks. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. It's a can't miss summer on today. They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Tell us what, what it was like. With our NBC News exclusive. Now 
Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I'm here at the Acne Smoked Fish Factory. Now there is something fishy going on in there, and you better believe I'm gonna find out what it is. The folks at Acme process, smoke, and pack nearly 8 million pounds of fish every year. They sell to eateries all over the country, including Russ and Daughters. It smells of smoke and it smells of fish. That's the way it's supposed to be. It smells right. like New York City. Yes. All right, so as you know, in any food, food plant, food safety is uh -huh. of paramount importance. Right. I see you got your boots on I here. just happen to be wearing these. Awesome. <laughs> I'll walk you through the process of how salmon turns into smoked salmon. Adam Kaslow is the fourth generation owner of Acme Smoked Fish. His great grandfather, Harry Brownstein, started selling fish after immigrating from Russia to Brooklyn. Wow. Harry started in the smoked fish business in the early 1900s, in 1906 to be exact. Out, he of, went, out of a push cart? Out of a, 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 a horse drawn wagon. Wow. He would go around buying fish from different smokehouses throughout Brooklyn and Queens and had himself the sales route. You know, he worked close to 45 years. I mean, his dream was to open up his own smokehouse, and it took him 45 years to finally achieve that. Wow. Adam now runs a massive smoked fish empire, supplying many of New York City's popular bagel shops, from H&H &H to Essa Bagel. Acme also selling to national grocers, like Trader Joe's. At the end of the day, uh -huh. it's all about the fish. We bring in fish from all over the world. Uh -huh. Smoked salmon is probably the most popular thing that we make, and our salmon come from different places, Norway, Scotland, Chile, and Alaska. It can take up to five days to make smoked salmon. Every order is made to the buyer's tastes, from the type of salmon to the curing method. The first step, cutting a whole fish into fillets. Whoa! Yeah, so this is a 12 kilo whole salmon Jeez. that I caught over here in Long Island Sound. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is an Atlantic salmon. Uh -huh. It's farm, farm raised. We use Atlantic salmon because it has the, the most fat and fat equals flavor when making smoked, smoked salmon. Right. So what are you cutting out the, like the backbone there? Yeah, just do your bone. Uh-huh. Carving into a fish this size requires expert hands. After the fish is filleted, it's preserved with salt. The fish is then treated with a wet brine or a dry cure. Okay, so let's dry, dry cure some, some salmon. Good. First thing, we're gonna get it onto the uh, raft. Okay. okay. So, see if you can pick up this salmon, grab it by the, by the, the tail. Okay. Grab with your other hand. Underneath. And we're going to lay it onto this, the, the screen. Okay. Perfect. Great. Step two, we're going to grab a handful of salt. So it's just a thin layer. Yep. Right along the top of the dorsal. Like kind of down the center line, I suppose. And we'll... Give it a nice love, love tap. That's it? That's it. This fish is rather large. So traditionally we would probably dry, uh, wet brine uh -huh. this, this fish, but for smaller fish, the, the dry cure lasts about 24 hours. Okay, that's a huge fish. Right. After curing, the fillets are cold smoked for up to 20 hours 
This process imparts a subtle smoky flavor. Let me show you how the smoker works. So these are a collection of that wood chip blend that we were uh -huh. talking about earlier. There are different ways to smoke fish fillets. Hot smoking results in flaky, opaque fillets. Unlike traditional lox, smoked salmon is cold smoked below 85 degrees. This helps the fish retain its silky texture and makes it perfect for slicing. Ready to help me get this bad boy into the You oven? bet. All right. All right. Hey now. Let's close her up. Woo! Shut her down. After the smoker, the fish is cooled, then packed for shipping. What would your great grandfather say if he could see all of this? I think he'd be amazed at how difficult it was for him to achieve his dream. Right. Now his descendants have been able to build upon that dream and build us into one of the preeminent smokers in the US. Up next, a vegan deli taking on tradition with plant-based lox and cashew cream cheese? Oh, you don't want to miss this. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Back on the Lower East Side, two sisters inspired by their Jewish heritage are on a mission to make the food they loved growing up in a more sustainable way. Ladies, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Boom. you. Boom, wanna show me around? Please, come Play, on in. Lead away. Erica and Sarah Kaberski are the co-owners of Orchard Grocer, an entirely vegan market inspired by classic delicatessens. This is our healthy cashew cream cheese. They wanna make the vegan lifestyle easier for all. Right after college, they opened their first business, a shoe store called Moo Shoes. We opened our vegan shoe store 20 years ago. How are they? They're comfortable? They are, yeah. About five years ago, we decided that we were going to update it by adding our vegan grocer, basically because it seemed like that's what our customers want. Um, after asking us what our shoes were made of, probably where should I go eat was um, the second most common question. So we decided to create an experience where they could just go eat next door. Growing up in Queens, the sisters' Jewish culture and food were closely linked. They had 10 Jewish delis in their neighborhood alone. Probably every Sunday, is a tradition in our family, a dozen bagels um, at the bagel store. A dozen always meant 15. I don't know <laughs> why that was, but and uh, with the cream cheese and lox, and that was just uh, how we spent our Sundays. Both sisters became vegan as teenagers, but felt they lost a piece of their roots by giving up certain foods. I think our parents were supportive of our changes to the vegan lifestyle. We grew up in a very culturally Jewish household, so all of our traditions were just based around food. Today, a lot of folks are going vegan for a variety of reasons, from reported health benefits to concerns over animal welfare. For the sisters, it's also a matter of global importance. We're watching climate change happen right now, and 
I think that's causing a lot of people to think twice about what they're eating and how they are contributing. So it makes sense to us that it is becoming so mainstream. In 2017, Sarah and Erica saw not just an opportunity to satisfy a growing market, but to pay homage to their Jewish roots. We wanted to have a, a good sandwich selection that really epitomizes like New York deli food. So obviously a bagel and mox was gonna be there. Orchard Grocer sells a variety of vegan sandwiches, including Reuben's and tuna melts. But the sisters are most passionate about serving up a sense of nostalgia. People are so worried about giving things up. So I think just creating those alternatives and just something that people are familiar with and gives them that feeling of home. Yeah, like we haven't had to give up our Sunday tradition of um, bagels and lox. To help make their unique deli a reality, the sisters hired vegan chef Nora Vargas. Nora shares a passion for plant-based foods. She also knows how to turn carrots into salty lox. How did you come up? I mean, you have to think, okay, what can mimic uh, mm -hmm. a smoked salmon? Yeah. And so how did you, was it look like, like you yeah. thought, well, the only orange vegetable out there, <laughs> exactly. other than a sweet potato, <laughs> is carrot. We know the texture that we need to go for. We know the flavor that we want to go for. So we started with the color and then we just kind of built it from there. Okay, so let's get started. I'm, I'm really fascinated. Okay, all right, I'm excited. So we have prepared, what do we have, maybe 10 pounds of carrots here wow. for you. These are huge. These would have been huge carrots. Seriously, yeah, like wow. the size of my forearm. But you, <laughs> you have, you have Slice them very thin on a mandolin? Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. All right, so we're all gloved up and we are going to, the next step in this process is to uh, apply our rub okay. to our carrots. So in here we have a mixture of sugar, salt, and the rest I can't tell you about. Oh, it's a secret exactly. kind of thing. Yeah. So this, this would be kind of like the brine that you would mm -hmm. use, the dry brine that you would use yes. on fish. Exactly. Except yeah. it's going on vegetables. Yeah. We got our inspiration for a lot of different components of this recipe from the way that you would actually prepare fish if we were preparing fish and not carrots. Right. Coat everything. Hmm. Interesting. Oh no, don't smell it. Don't, don't figure out the secret just I'm, by smelling I'm, it. Okay, now. Because if I figure it out, she's going to have to kill me. <laughs> So I'm just going to start rubbing, just smushing everything in there. Once we get everything coated, we would let this sit for three to six hours, mm -hmm. probably. Okay, great. So I think we've, I think we nailed it. Okay. In here. Is another secret ingredient? Definitely. Jeez, yeah, a, but I can tell you. A lot you. of secrets here at Orchard. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit. Okay. Okay. So it's a combination of olive oil mm -hmm. and aquafaba. Aquafaba? Yeah. Are you familiar with that ingredient? I don't know. You know when you're opening up a can of beans right. and you got to drain them? Yes. The stuff that you drain out, that's aquafaba. Aquafaba. It's, like, it's bean water. It's bean, bean juice. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pour okay. and then you can kind of do the same process. Okay. That we same did before. process. Just squish it all in there, okay? Yeah, perfect. After we had let our carrots sit for three to six hours, right. um, we tossed them in the oven. So they bake. We like to call it cold smoking ah. to sound like classy. Um, like the process of making smoked salmon. Exactly, yeah. That That's does right. look very much like smoked salmon. <laughs> and what would a bagel and lox be without the cream cheese? This vegan spread is made with raw cashews, salt, some secret spices, and coconut oil, all blended together with soft tofu. Should we make a bagel? Sure, let's do it. Chai talk. Cheers. This is a really terrific idea. Thank I'm, you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That yeah. is fantastic. Like a great way to finish things up. I mean, we've, we've seen the history, we've gone to the past, we were in the present, and you have brought us the lox and bagels of the future! <laughs> a bagel with cream cheese and smoked salmon is a uniquely American combination. Born from Jewish roots, transformed by local ingredients, and carried on by new generations, this breakfast tradition has truly stood the test of time when it comes to food in New York City.
welcome to Shark Watch Today, our special all about one of the ocean's most iconic predators. You guessed it, the shark. I'm Kerry Sanders. Over the years, I've been lucky enough to cover some incredible stories about these formidable creatures. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll share some amazing survival stories from folks who have encountered sharks in open water. When you think about sharks, the first thing that comes to mind might be the Steven Spielberg classic Jaws, a movie so realistic it actually convinced some people to stay out of the water. But while they might seem scary, sharks actually play an incredibly important role in our ocean's ecosystems. Watch out, Chris. She got it. She got it. Mary Lee. Give her line if you have to. And Catherine are great whites. It's a female. We got good water flow in both gills. Captured. Lift it up a little. Let's put the accelerometer on. Tagged with electronic transmitters. She's a thick girl. And then released. Good luck, old girl. I am ecstatic. They've been bait and switching with us all day, playing cat and mouse, and finally we got one. For the last three years, every time their fins break the surface, scientists with O-Search get a ping revealing locations. So popular is this first of its kind data, Mary Lee Shark now has a big following on Twitter. The Mary Lee Shark family just hit 70,000 followers. Somebody break out the bubbly. And there she is, that's Mary Lee. That's the famous Mary Lee that everybody's paying attention to right now. Why are we so fascinated? Oh, it's a, it, because it's a white shark. White sharks are the most charismatic, and now we're following one, we're spying on one, and she's tweeting back. Since Mary Lee began transmitting, she's traveled an astonishing 20,207 miles, and Catherine, 13,679 miles. In all, 53 great white sharks tagged and transmitting. But so far, no discernible pattern. Now we're getting a sense of the scope, at least, of their movements, and they're far more dynamic than we ever thought. From the coast off Nantucket, south to Miami Beach, and into the Gulf of Mexico, we now know great whites are frequently just yards from the beach. A Pew Charitable Trust study says an estimated 100 million sharks are killed each year by commercial fisheries. At that rate, a third of all the 500 shark species are threatened with extinction, including some fear the great white. Sharks have a reputation for aggression towards humans, but when you actually look at the numbers, well, there's very little reason to fear a shark. In 2021, the International Shark Attack file reported only 73 confirmed unprovoked attacks by sharks on a human around the world. But the unlucky few who have encountered a shark have a harrowing tale to tell. A summer of sharks up and down no, the no, eastern no, no, seaboard. No, no, no. Oh my God. This morning, Jordan Pushinsky is recovering after a terrifying incident on Ocean City Beach last week. It felt like something ran into my legs and I ran out and I find blood everywhere. The 12 year old receiving 42 stitches from the first non fishing shark bite in Maryland's history. In a community on Longboat Key, Florida, sharks in the backyard canals. Shark land. Janelle Branauer has lived here for 15 years, but she's never seen anything like this. There was just thousands of them. It felt like you could walk across the canal on the backs of the shark. All seeking refuge from a deadly red tide, which saps oxygen from the salt water that sharks and all fish need to survive. We had a lot of bonnet head, um, we had a lot of nurse sharks, and then a few lemon sharks. Lemons are like the most aggressive. In Panama City Beach, this hammerhead chasing fish came frighteningly close to an unsuspecting swimmer before darting away. Surf instructor Atsushi Yamada was bitten on the leg while teaching surfing to kids on Tybee Island, Georgia, a region with three reported shark bites in the last two weeks. I feel like I got hit by a baseball bat. Up north, a string of shark sightings off Long Island. You saw a fin, you could not mistake it. Further off the coast, remarkable drone footage as sharks feast on millions of fish. In Cape Cod, the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy confirming multiple white shark sightings. As we go August and September, that is, you know, when we see some of the peak white shark activity. The group tracks the ocean's top predators as part of its research and conservation efforts. 
white sharks are spending a good amount of time in waters that are, you know, about 15 feet of water or less at times. As beachgoers soak up the rest of summer, scientists say to remember, risk of a shark bite remains extremely low. They have no interest in people or anything our size as food. Sharks in our waters are a sign of a healthy ocean. We're happy to report that as our story aired, Jordan's doing great since the incident and recently graduated from seventh grade. Way to go, Jordan. While Yamada has struggled with PTSD since his attack, he's still a surf instructor and says that he is, I quote, still thinking about the shark who attacked me. Since they began keeping shark attack statistics back in 1882, Volusia County, Florida, has been deemed the shark attack bite capital in the world. More shark attacks there are 337 than anywhere else in the world. Experts say it's a case of geography. The sharks like to swim in that area. And also, it's where we ran up with Maggie Crum, who was bitten by a shark. Right there is the stitches. A nine-year-old Ohio girl has a terrifying tale to tell classmates about what she did on her summer vacation. I got bit by a shark. Maggie Crum in Florida with her family for the first time was in knee-deep water when she felt something tug at her leg. It felt like a grab at first and then like it just ripped into the skin and that's when it hurt and felt like a bite. Her parents learning New Smyrna Beach is the shark bite capital of the world only after they arrived. We didn't tell the girls <laughs> in an effort to keep them going to the water. And we talked about it and we said, you know, there's no sharks that shallow. There's nothing to worry about. When Maggie screamed, her mother thought she was faking until... She lifted her leg out of the water and I saw blood running down her leg. I was like, let's get out of the water. <laughs> A firefighter and paramedic, she knew it was no joke. With as big of cuts as was in her back of her leg, we knew right away it was a shark. Maggie got 12 stitches. You can see like the circle how big their mouth was. Already this year, at least 10 people have been bitten by sharks off New Smyrna Beach, including five in the last month alone. As for Maggie, this fourth grader has a new necklace, a new scar, and the courage to go back into the water. Because what are the odds that you're going to be bit twice? I asked Maggie about the possible fears of getting back into the water. She said, I'm going to quote her here. The chances of getting bitten by another shark are a big fat zero. Now, when we come back, we'll hear from more survivors, including a father whose swift action likely saved his son's life. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Shark Watch. If it seems like the last two decades have had an increase in documented shark attacks, that's because they have. Marine biologists speculate that higher water temperatures are bringing the fish closer to shore which brings the predators closer to the food source and in this next case 
closer to an unlucky tourist in waist deep water. The aftermath was captured on camera, so we should warn you this is somewhat graphic. Mark Bowden leaving a Miami hospital, remarkably walking on his own after a shark bit into his right leg. The gash so deep it cut well into his muscle. It just felt like something punched my leg really hard. The 31-year-old, not so lucky he was attacked, but very fortunate Miami Beach Ocean Rescue was there within moments. Mark's girlfriend holding his leg and hand. I was super worried. After several anxious minutes on shore, Mark even managed to make Maria smile. He made a joke and I said, man, this is happening. I can't believe it. On vacation from Santa Rosa, California, Mark was body surfing when it happened. I didn't feel pain, but I, I guess it was a, a duller feeling. Um, you know, I've read that shark's teeth are so sharp. It's like a surgeon's scalpel that uh, it was just a really clean bite. And would you say that was the case? I, I would say that was the case and, and I'm sure a little bit of shock too. Brant Davis visiting from Pittsburgh was swimming nearby. He he asked me, hey, did you feel that? I had no, I did not realize he just got bit by a shark. It happened that quick. Mark told me he feels lucky he didn't lose a leg or worse. Afterwards, they were saying it was uh, probably a, a black tip because they saw some drone footage of some black tips in the area. Black tip sharks are common along the coast here with three rows of razor-like teeth. The predators can grow to more than six feet in length, often swimming close to shore in search of food. Did you see bait fish around there when you got hit? There were a lot of fish in the water. Um, in, in California, like I, I surf and swim, and we don't have schools of fish like that. I didn't know that was something to, to look out for. For others on the beach, the attack reason enough to go no further than the sand. It makes me kind of fearful to get in the water. I don't really want to swim anymore. It's kind of dangerous. I don't think I can stay out of the water. Uh, I think at some point I'll be going back in. Since our story aired, we reached out to Mark, and he says other than being a little more cautious when swimming in the ocean, he has had no long-term effects from the shark bite. Now, after healing, he returned to running his organic tea company, Tea and Trumpets, which he still runs to this day. Since 1837, there have been 107 unprovoked shark attacks in South Carolina, to date making it the fourth most likely state in the United States for unprovoked shark attacks following Florida, Hawaii, and California. North Carolina follows closely behind with 76 recorded attacks. One of those unlucky few was 16-year-old Nick Arthur, whose life was saved by his father's quick thinking. It started out just like any other day at the beach for 16-year-old Nick Arthur from North Carolina. He and his sister were jumping over waves on a sandbar just 25 feet from the shore on the outer banks near Cape Hatteras when Nick started screaming. The family spoke to WGHP. So I like tried lifting my leg up out of the water and I saw, oh my God, it's a five foot long shark attached to my leg. His sister swam for help and their father came to the rescue. My hands were bleeding and we just lots of blood and sand all mixed together. I couldn't really see what was going on. My fingers were all scratched up. I was trying to pry its mouth open. They were both hitting the shark, but when Tim Arthur kicked its nose, it finally let go. 40 teeth puncture marks on Nick's leg. He survived the attack, walking away with scratches to his hands, stitches to his leg, but no serious damage. In another close encounter earlier this month, two fishermen were surprised by a great white shark circling their boat near Ocean City, Maryland. It's a massive animal. Despite their presence, fewer shark attacks have actually been reported this year, according to the University of Florida's International Shark Attack File, likely due to beach closures during the COVID pandemic. There are, on average, 80 shark attacks each year. The odds, I always say, are really, really, really low. So far, just 18 documented shark bites have been reported worldwide, with at least seven in the U.S., including North Carolina, Florida, Hawaii, California, and Delaware. While shark attacks are rare, they can be deadly. Male with a shark bite, not conscious, breathing. Just last month, surfer Ben Kelly died from leg wounds after he was attacked by a great white shark just 100 yards off the coast of Santa Cruz, California. 
As the summer heats up and beaches continue to reopen, experts say it's always important to be within range of someone who can assist you. No one thinks it's going to happen to them until it happens to them. For today, Kerry Sanders, NBC News. So remember, always swim in groups as sharks are more likely to attack a solitary individual. Avoid swimming near bait fish where sharks might be feeding. And remember that sharks are most likely to feed at dusk and at dawn. Coming up, we'll hear a young girl's remarkable story of survival after losing part of her leg to a shark bite. And later, how one mom's romantic getaway turned into a living nightmare. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody good and that's it. Yeah. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Shark Watch. If you're heading to the beach this summer, you're not alone. Some of America's most popular beaches receive an estimated 19 million visitors annually. Teenager Paige Winter was enjoying a day at the beach with her family when the unthinkable happened. Take a look. I'm not alone. 17 year old Paige Winter lost her left leg and two fingers when she was attacked by a shark in these waters off North Carolina. I want people to see that I'm doing all right. Today, just 12 days later, amazingly upbeat. When I was in that water, I was like praying. I'm like, I'm 17. I got so much to do. <laughs> Today, her dad, Charlie, recounted his fight with the shark, pulling Paige from its jaws. It was just an immediate dad thing. I grabbed her with my left arm and I pulled her up over the water. And when I pulled her up, a shark came up with her. He struggled to shore his daughter in his arms. And I don't think I've ever told any of my children I loved him so much so many times. As a paramedic, he knew stopping the bleeding was vital. Doctors say the two most critical factors to Paige's survival, her courageous father, and a belt used as a tourniquet. Paige's nurse says her patient okay is brave and determined. And she looked at me, she goes, okay, we're gonna get out of this bed tomorrow. Paige remains an advocate of marine life. On social media, her hashtag is sharks are still good people. The fight to survive, fueling a teen with an unstoppable attitude. They're going to be able to do just kind of like everything. Kerry Sanders, NBC News, Atlantic Beach, North Carolina. Paige's father says she's been through a lot and is doing great, graduating and heading into the workforce. And he says Paige still loves all animals, cats, cows, and yes, even sharks. Still ahead, a young mom who nearly lost her life when a shark attacked her while snorkeling in the Bahamas. We'll be right back. 
the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Shark Watch. In 2017, 32-year-old Tiffany Johnson and her husband were on vacation in the Bahamas. They paid passage in one of those small charter boats to go about two miles off the coast near Paradise Island. They decided to jump in and go snorkeling. And that's when Tiffany felt something on her right arm. Here's her story. And it didn't hurt. It just, it honestly felt like I had bumped into something. I just kind of turned casually to see what I bumped into. And when I turned, I was face to face with a shark. Within moments, Tiffany says the crystal clear Bahamian waters turned murky with her own blood. But surprisingly, Tiffany told me she felt no pain. I remember thinking, I remember thinking, this is not the end for me. I am, I'm not going to die here. He's not going to take my life. As she screamed for help, her husband jumped in. I seen her and half of her arm was gone, so I figured it was a shark, but... I, the only thing that's in my mind was going out there to save her. Together, they made it back to the boat, James pushing his wife up to the deck. And I'm just praying at that time that the shark's not following us. The mother of three, 20 minutes from shore with an arterial bleed that could cause death within minutes, gave her husband very specific directions that may have saved her life. I was calm. And I just, I told him, go, go get something, go get a towel. I, got, I have to wrap it up. For her to be able to keep no, her calm during that whole time. I've never seen anything like it. I closed my eyes and I just began to pray hardcore prayers. Remarkably still conscious, Tiffany made it to the hospital in Nassau for surgery. Behind the scenes, frantic efforts were made to arrange a medevac flight to the Carolinas Medical Center in Charlotte, where Tiffany had another life-saving surgery. It's just a limb. I mean, I'm here, you know, I, he has me as his uh, yeah. wife, my kids have my me kids have. as a mother and, I, you know, I have my family and I'm alive, so yeah. I, I'm grateful for that, yeah. for sure. Really a remarkable story and just a few weeks ago, Tiffany, yes, was back in the water, snorkeling again for the first time since her accident five years ago. You go, Tiffany. Now also in the Bahamas, seasoned diver Jonathan Hernandez was attacked by a shark while spear fishing. He credits the speedy medical attention given to him by his fellow fishermen with saving his life. I got hit so hard from behind I thought the boat had run me over. I immediately looked to my left side and the shark was right in my face. This morning, a Florida man is telling his amazing survival story after a terrifying tussle with a shark in the Bahamas. I was able to get away, I was kicking away. I looked in the water and I could see that my calf was hanging and gushing blood into the water. Jonathan Hernandez, a professional boat captain and fisherman, was spearfishing in the waters off Abaco Island when a shark came out of nowhere. It all happened so fast, it was, it was kind of a, a blur of white water and fins and thrashing. I'm gonna lift my leg up if you wanna just pull the tape off. An experienced diver, Hernandez told his fishing buddies to quickly make tourniquets out of weight belts. The fact that the tourniquet went on within 60 to 90 seconds of the actual attack was 
probably the single biggest factor in why I'm sitting here talking to you today. I believe this is his top jaw, and this on the, the side is going to be his bottom jaw. His frightening attack happening just days before a California college student was fatally attacked while snorkeling with her family. Witnesses say this is the tiger shark that attacked 21-year-old Jordan Lindsay, a family spokesman telling NBC News they are still in a state of semi-paralyzed shock. Jordan's family now focused on getting her body home to California. Hernandez blames the recent attacks on popular shark feeding businesses in the Bahamas that let tourists have up-close encounters with sharks. They're associating humans with getting food and it's making it very dangerous to be in the water, whether you're spearing or you just happen to be snorkeling near where they're feeding them. Spearfishing, of course, does come with a level of risk because sharks are often looking for the same fish as prey. So a few tips. Always dive with a buddy, avoid murky water, and deposit the fish you catch in between catches back in the boat. Now, another sport with a risk of shark attacks, surfing. From 20 to 2019, a majority of the unprovoked attacks occurred while victims were engaged in activities like surfing, water skiing, windsurfing, boogie boarding, rafting, or just floating on inflatables. Austin Reed was one of them. This morning, a young surfer is recovering after a terrifying attack. I thought like the shark was about to go into like a frenzy with all the blood in the water. 19-year-old Austin Reed seen here entering the water at North Carolina's Ocean Isle Beach just 30 minutes before the vicious predator, presumed to be a shark, bit into his right foot. It was like a lot of pressure like on my foot and it kind of like tugged me down. The grip released and Austin's friend helped him swim to shore. We're on the Ocean Isle Beach. We got a shark right here. My mom's a nurse. She's down by him. She's trying to help him. Austin's mother, Kim, a registered nurse, made a tourniquet out of a beach towel as paramedics rushed to the scene. My ER brain went, oh, it's just his foot. I'm like, dit, 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 dit. any arteries, any, you know, he's, he's going to be okay. Here in North Carolina, Austin doctors say that those bite marks are consistent with the bite from a very large shark. That would make this the second shark attack here in just over a week. The first one was just up the coast in Fort Macon State Park eight days ago. There has been a shark attack. There's somebody in the water bleeding. 17-year-old Paige Winter suffered devastating injuries to her leg, pelvis, and hands. The severity of the attack ultimately forcing doctors to amputate her leg. And just over two weeks ago, 65-year-old Thomas Smiley was attacked and killed off of Kanapali Beach in Maui. In 2018, there were 32 shark attacks recorded in the U.S., a decline from 53 the year before. For Austin Reed, neither injury nor fear will keep him from the ocean. I got bit by a shark. And it got me pretty good, but I'm still going to go out in the water just because I love to do it. Since our story first aired, we found out Austin is pursuing a career in medicine and currently works in the same emergency room where he was taken to after his shark attack. Wow. Now, while it may seem like I've covered quite a few shark attacks in my day, the odds of experiencing an attack yourself really are low. According to the National Geographic, the odds of dying from a shark attack are 1 in 3.7 million. To put that into perspective, a person has about a 1 in 15,000 chance of being struck by lightning in their lifetime. So don't be afraid to keep enjoying our incredible oceans. Well, that's our show. We hope you've enjoyed some of these amazing survival stories. I'm Kerry Sanders. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Today shows newest fan. Little 
Al Roker. Well, just if, how are you doing? I, I know every day is different. How do you feel today? Yes, I, it's, it is the strange thing about MS. It really, it really is so variable and changes. I'm feeling really great now. I mean, I'm here with you. We're in front of a fire. I have my dog. I'm going to see my horse. I wrote a book. The book is phenomenal. I'll just say it. You are a writer, Selma Blair. Thank you. It means so much. It's hard enough to write a book. It's, it's hard, harder still to do it when you don't have all your faculties about you every day. It was the kindness of strangers who are no longer strangers, Brittany Bloom and my, my, my book agent at the book group and Julie. Um, the space they held for me and helping me and helping me type. I would send on a you know, yellow legal pad and take a picture. Be like, can you type this? And now, of course, now that the book's finished, I, I can read them right. <laughs> Just fine. Mm. <laughs> Suspicious. <laughs> I know. Funny but, how that worked. But we got through it. We got through it. And how do you feel knowing it's about to be out in the universe? I'm thrilled because when I did come out with the MS diagnosis, it really felt freeing. Um, but mostly to see that it helped other people just have a touchstone made me feel really good. It made me feel more useful. Um, I'd always get on myself, oh, you're lazy, you want to sleep. But then when I realized just at least by the act of being as honest as I could, um, it, it did something for other people and that in turn empowered me and you know it's just a whole thing of we're all, in, we're all in this together. Well, it's called Mean Baby. You gotta explain the title. When I was just born, people came over to visit the new Beitner baby, that was my last name. And they ran out of that house. These teenagers, don't go over there. The Beitners have a mean baby. <laughs> and it's stuck. The things you're called, how they become part of your story, whether you mean to or not sometimes. You write in the book about um, some very painful episodes, including um, you wrote about a teacher, an educator, who violated you. And you say, he didn't rape me, but he broke me. He broke me. I loved him. Loved him. Father figure. Having a personal betrayal of someone that loves you be so inconsiderate of your life path really hurt. It hurt me. And I miss him still as a friend, mm -hmm. the person that I had met and, and cared for as a mentor. But It feels to me you were quite courageous. I discovered wonderful things writing the book, like how much I had witnessed of friends and what I'd witnessed and what a gift that was here, and even, you know, how much I loved sharing things with people. But it wasn't until writing this book, and, and there is this mention of a rape, it was something I didn't even think of, because I think there were so many trespasses on my life, or things were cloudy with my shame, my such a deep shame of my drinking in the past, that I was talking one day to Brittany, and I immediately told this after this spring break trip, and then, and I said, but I, I, I won't, I'm not gonna write that in the book. And she said, well, maybe you want to. And then I thought, oh, of course I have to. So many people have had some similar experiences that you just tuck away, because you think people are going to say, what did you do? And why didn't you report? And why didn't you do? Why didn't? I was a kid. I was young. And even now, it's hard to report stuff. It's hard. It's really hard. And so I put it in the book. And I even cringed as I was doing the audio book, because I thought, how many more stories do I have like this that I didn't even acknowledge? Because there's so many. And I felt so sad for my body. I felt so sad. It kind of took the book and this process to even make you realize that you, you were a victim. People can take advantage. And 
And then you're just too ashamed to say anything and then you just bury it and you bury it. You really do. And things do come back later when you're in a safer spot. But you still feel don't say you feel unsafe to say it, but I realize I am safe. And yeah, I am glad it's in the book. It's a big deal to have these things happen and to hold that shame in your cells like it's you. Like it's all you are is someone that's not worth helping on the side of the road, that you're worth someone to say. She's nothing. I'll never see her again. She's probably passed out the whole night. <laughs> you know, mm. well, the body remembers. The body remembers. And I want it to remember some love. I want it to remember this day. I want to remember this pink sweater and this dog and my son. I want to remember. I want to remember all the things that feel good. Yeah. I want other people to, too. Yeah. Don't be so indignant, because we can't all have our ways. Let's move forward and help each other. Yeah. Sometimes when horrible things happen, people, the shame cycle is so big. And I wanted to say, there is no real room for guilt in moving forward. There isn't. There's not much I feel ashamed of anymore, because it just happened. And I did it, or someone did it to me, and I'm, I'm OK now. But things will keep happening, and I'll keep having to figure out how to rise above. And in some ways, it's that um, frame of mind that helped you finally get rid of alcohol and kick alcohol out of your life. How did you finally conquer it? What made the difference for you? It was only self-medicating, and it wasn't working anymore. And when there was public humiliation and I owned it, it there's no going back. I mean, now that I was a mother, it just changed everything. I think that's incredibly inspiring. When you've made mistakes, you own them, and you turn the page, and you smile and go forward. You do what you can to make it right for those affected and yourself. And it's important that you acknowledge, really acknowledge, and, and nothing's gonna help by still beating yourself up. You write in the book, I desperately love a story. We all have one. I carry mine inside me. You carry yours inside you. I can hear mine now in my own voice, strong and clear. What's your story? My story is that People would say to me, and I would roll my eyes when they'd say, don't give up before the miracle, don't d commit suicide, because I really was. I could not picture living long. But I think that my story really is that I am figuring it out now, and I am kind to myself, and I really do, really do have the capability to love. You're not the mean baby. I'm not the mean baby. I mean, we all can be a mean baby sometimes. Well, she needs to come out sometimes. I mean, for sure. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
let's talk about your mom. It struck me that she was extraordinarily complex, glamorous, and beautiful, and dynamic, and also emotionally elusive to you at times, and sometimes cruel. I mean, I still adore my mother. She's the most important. My sisters, we cherish her, adore her. She's on a pedestal. But no, she was not a cuddly woman. She was a role model. She was a judge. She was a million things. Um, but her idea of me was not going to be met with, with what I was, I guess. I find it is so universal that we adore our parent so much, but, it, but it's complicated. I felt how torn you could be about your mom, who you clearly adored, and she adored you. And yet, there were stories that you reveal in the book that are kind of jaw-dropping. It's hard, because when you grow up with someone like that, you don't realize, because I'm a little like her, too. <laughs> you know, so you don't realize how, like, outlandish some things can seem when someone's kind of eccentric. Yeah. But my son said it to me. Um, I, I told him, you know, my mother, she was so critical by nature, and he's like, like you. And I'm like, <gasps> I am, but I think you're perfect. He's like, all you do is nag at me. I'm, oh, wow. Like, that's my kind of love language, thinking I could pick apart someone to make them better or something. I was really struck by when you were a little girl, one of the first things you learned is your mom saying, I wasn't sure when I was pregnant with my last baby that I really wanted to have a baby. But you know, in her defense to say, I didn't want you, it wasn't meant to be hateful. She meant it to say, Oh, that would have been such a mistake to get rid of you. Thank God I have baby Blair. What was it like to grow up in that house? I felt like dying growing up. I mean, I did. And that's why I feel like I'm such a miracle right now <laughs> that I actually want to live. I want to be here. I want to enjoy this. I was so confused and lost and terrified. I was a terrified baby. And your mom would introduce you as, and this is Blair this is or Selma. Blair, Selma, you both. I went by both. This is Selma. This is the manic depressive. I have never been diagnosed with mania or de depression tongues. <laughs> That's mania a label enough. to put on a little kid. But, you know, it was dramatic. I think she meant it as a badge of honor. Like, I don't suffer fools. Like, we got real problems here. My kid, my kid's very grounded. She's very deep and disturbed. You know, I think that she felt it out of gravity. Why were you so scared as a little girl? Who wouldn't be? Look at where we are. It's so weird. <laughs> And then you know you're gonna die one day and your mother's gonna die and your sisters. I mean, it's terrifying to be a child and so readily be able to explore uh, the scarier things in life. It was a preoccupation. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure that drinking uh, probably really cemented that mm -hmm. um, feeling in me. You started, you had your first drink when you were a little girl, seven years old. Yeah, my first drunk when I was seven. I had my first drinks, you know, much younger. Can you tell me about that? I thought it was God. It was at Passover Seder's uh, that I had my first drinks, and I always thought that was God. And then when I realized it wasn't, I was like, how convenient. It's in a bottle. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's even as a little kid, you're like, that's a comfort. So you started at seven, you drank through elementary school, middle school, high school, college. college. How did you do it? I mean, how did you function? I don't know how I did it. I do, it all makes sense why I was so exhausted. But it was, it was hard. I, I don't know, but and maybe it was easier. Maybe I would have never survived without a drink. How did it relieve your pain and your fears? Transitions have always been hard for me and the MS made that very evident. Um, so the drinking would, it, it made me feel warm and comfortable and part of people on this earth. You had a lot of physical ailments since you were a little girl. I mean, you tell the story about telling your mom your leg hurt. She's like, cut it out, Selma. You're I mean, I was made fun of my whole life for that leg. You and I'm like, this <laughs> and it was This leg? It was leg that I leg. I can't feel. Yeah, it was. And you had a fever for three years. I did. It was a big deal. I mean, doctors thought I had leukemia. We didn't know I didn't. I didn't, but it was, I had a constant high fever. I had so many things that were so indicative of MS growing and optical neuritis young and losing my vision for good. Do you feel, when you look at those physical ailments as a child, do you think, have you ever been told, that probably was the beginning of MS, or that oh, somehow absolutely. connected? 
Absolutely the ailments as a kid connected. I don't know if I really did have juvenile MS at like six when we noticed my eye was first going or movements, but I do know for sure I had it by the age of 23 and it was definitely there for so long. And the pain is still there. I'm in remission. I built no new lesions, but I still have the, you know, some brain damage and things that are there, but I'm okay with it. It's I'm okay, I'm grateful, because I'm doing so much better. Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Let's talk about your MS diagnosis. How do you feel about the fact that it took so long to get a proper diagnosis? It never occurred to me. Never occurred to me to have a neurological illness. That was the onset of MS, which is just a symptom of a really unhealthy immune system. I thought I had a million things that weren't what they were. And I would have been a lot kinder to myself if I didn't feel the need to self-medicate or check out or get through. I mean, I wasn't always checking out. I was really trying to be as capable as I could be, and I had no idea, and I was really cruel to myself. I treated myself like garbage. And the medical community sometimes was saying, maybe it's in your mind. It's like, oh, you're fine, you're dramatic, you're talkative, you're... But I would say, I am so tired, I can't move, and this, is hap this has been going on for 20 years. Even that doctor that diagnosed me, he was saying this might be functional, emotional, what traumas happen. And I fell asleep in his office, and he said to my boyfriend at the time, What's she doing? And he's like, oh, she falls asleep everywhere. And he's like, oh, wait, stand up. Put your arms out. Shut your eyes. Plank. Fell over. Like, had no idea of proprioception. I didn't know I had proprioception issues. I didn't know that my vision was a hallway. Because if you've had it your whole life, you just think that's how everyone is. It was, was mind-blowing to realize there was a diagnosis for this and that other people have it and don't know. And I don't mean to be tough on the doctors, but you really, you really got to do better for the women. You have to do better for all of us in diagnosing these things. You didn't have to come out publicly. You didn't have to share your journey. Why did you make that choice? I hadn't worked for years because I had been so sick, and I, it was kind of flaring because, worse because I was going back to work. I was getting on planes. The planes make it worse. I was falling apart in the airport. I couldn't get out of the fetal position or else my body would spasm. And I was getting vertigo all the time. And the doctor even said, with the best intentions, don't tell people. Like, just don't. We're going to get this under control. But because I had such a bad reaction to the first treatment, it made it so much worse. I was really um, having a lot of movement and speech difficulties that were exacerbated by the prednisone. It just kept getting worse as the diagnosis went on. So it was, so the stem cell really helped. But coming out and talking about it, the story would be told anyhow. 
So I wanted to gain control of that. And I didn't realize how empowering it would be and how empowered I would be to then tell the truth forevermore after that. What did you think when you started seeing the reaction? I was so touched and I felt so thrilled. Oh, this is what it is to just be a human and show up. Mm -hmm. And to think that there's even a moment that I could have com comforted someone or given them an option or think about maybe if stem cells right for them. I'm really, really happy to be able to walk into this space of uh, empowerment and realizing I, I am a calm and stable grown up. I'm okay, <laughs> even though I've not always been. You had a big night at the Vanity Fair party. That was your first night coming out since your diagnosis. What did it take to do it and what did it mean to you to be there? I had no idea how much it would mean to show up trying to look my best in a really aggressive flare and that was a real coming out party for me because I know it meant something to other people and certainly to people with more radical disabilities to see an in, you know? Oh right, this world is ours too. We might not see the ramp there on the stage, but there's people coming to use it and I'm gonna be one of them. I remember our moment meeting. And, and I loved you so much and you were such a girl. You were such a sister to me. And we were in the bathroom and I felt really nervous and you really took my hand. I had the cane, I had the dress, but everyone scurried away as they should. And you stayed. I was overwhelmed that night and it was hard. I was afraid that I would vomit. That used to happen out of nowhere. I was afraid I'd trip and ruin the dress. Just really very real things of, oh my God, I'm not in the same body. And I just cried because of gratitude, but also I don't know if I can get through this night. Yeah, it was courageous. You wrote that you never practiced the Oscar speech in front of a mirror, that you never really had those leading lady aspirations. No. Why not? I never felt I was I was the one leading the pack here. I was very comfortable to witness the greats and be a part of it. But I dare say, I, I'd probably chase that leading lady role a little harder now. <laughs> but I didn't have it in me before. I didn't want to. Well, maybe you I didn't will. even want to, but maybe I will one day. Maybe it will be there for me. I mean, I'm improving on all the ways. But consistency is really key on a set and the energy and Certain triggers will make my body do different things. And I'm not embarrassed of it, but I don't want to take people's time. Yeah. But yet I would like to, I saw it, Christine Applegate, you know, she did the last season of Dead to Me, and she was really dealing with a lot of health, major health challenges, and watching her do it, that was an inspiration. So it's like, okay, if I were ever be able to go back to work, I'd want it to be incredible. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. That brings us to the documentary because the documentary really tells the story. When I watched the documentary, the word that I thought of was fearless. You were fearless. I'm so sorry, I can't talk right now. We're shooting the final days of my life. You showed it all. Yeah. Why did you want to do that? Because what I was going through with MS looked nothing like. I just couldn't find it. Jen Brea, she did a documentary I saw called Unrest. 
She had like an inflammatory, like there was an encephalitis issue and it's very similar to what I was going through. And I thought, I can't believe a woman is showing this and not afraid someone's gonna put her in a straitjacket. And if you say too much, they think you're a mental patient. The doctor would tell me, you're just dehydrated. <sighs> Everyone gets stressed. I was always so afraid of losing credibility. And so she gave me permission. That documentary of opening her life made me feel like I had permission to also have that impact for someone. So I've had a mess many years. I had a very late diagnosis. I've had it at least 25 years, at least. So I had nothing. There was any embarrassment I could get over. But if there's someone else that it would move the needle for them to have some agency in their life and to trust themselves, no matter how odd or dramatic or nothing their symptoms might be from day to day. Because this is the stuff I was afraid of. Let's talk about Arthur, that sweet boy. In a way, the documentary was for him. Why did you want him to see this someday? Has he seen it? He has seen it, finally. He went to the premiere. He, he is. He's like, it wasn't that boring. Thanks. He liked it. When I was going to do stem cell, I thought because I felt so physically and emotionally so awful and drained that I did think there's a chance I won't make it. And so I did want that to be to him knowing that if I did go because my body had given out, that I wanted him to know that I really wanted to be here with him. I really wanted to take the, the steps that it took to be here. Because I was really one of those people that was like, no way, even if I have cancer, I'll never do chemo. That's just the worst thing for your body. I had a real feeling about that. And then when I felt the chemo and I felt better, it's like, okay, just let go of what you're thinking and just try and feel better for your son. But yeah, you can die. I thought if anyone would die, it would be me in that moment because I just was so, I was just so tired. Oh. So I did it for him really um, to just say, I. I did want to communicate with you. You're too young to really care now, and I don't tell you, but I, I want you to know you're the last, you're the first thing on my mind and the last thing on my mind. You, you fought to still be here. Yeah. And with I'm everything you've really got. Well. I really did, and I know we, we all will come to times where we're gonna have to fight harder than we think, and, and I was supported, I was lucky. What do you hope he sees when he sees you moving through the world? I hope he sees that when you have something that could potentially be a real setback, in time, it might not happen right away, but in time, set yourself up to recover, you know? And I don't want him to feel ashamed or too scared that he can't move forward. I am so grateful that I'm moving forward because I did not want to my whole life. I wanted to figure out how to die with the least pain possible. <laughs> and I don't now. What kind of mom do you think you are? Embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I talk too much to strangers. But I think I am fun. He loves that I'm willing. If he wakes me up in the middle of the night and he can't sleep, it's like, okay, let's go find an adventure. Like for an hour and then we'll go back to bed. There's things that I see that I was scared of that he doesn't have at all. I give him, he does not want the effusive love that I craved from my mother. So he'll have his own memoir about how I, you know, tried to kiss him too much. But I, I, I give him, I give him tons of space. I can really see him as his own person, but I love, I love that I'm the person he, he comes to, that he trusts the most. You went and saw a psychic or a fortune teller, and this person told you you're gonna be an advocate. It was Tyler Henry. And I was like, is there anything in my future? And he's like, I don't really see you acting. <laughs> and I was like, cut the tapes, guys. <laughs> I want people to think. You know, but I had been really sick for a long time. And he, he did say, I see you being an advocate. I never saw in a million years that I would be an advocate of let's calm, regroup, and figure out how to move forward. And I'm here. Your inspiration comes from overcoming, whether it's MS or addiction, yeah. or abuse, or hardship, or it's and overcoming. All it's such a relief to give myself permission to say it's okay. No matter what, the guilt doesn't move through. I have to realize that. 
it's okay to so be light. So it's not that I'm being cocky of yes. saying like, oh, forgive myself for these things, but truthfully, you're not going to help anyone else until you've forgiven yourself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. What is happening, friends? Thanks for being here for today's Pop Start Plus. We got a good one for you today. Ethan Hawke has a really fascinating documentary series, six episodes, and it's about the lives of legendary actors Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. He told us all about their love story in Studio 1A. That's coming up. Plus, we spoke to the cast of Rutherford Falls about Native joy and telling Native American stories. And later, we're going to close things out on the show today. We've got a glimpse at a 12-year-old Daniel Radcliffe as he was just adjusting to newfound Harry Potter fame. All that coming up. But first, here's today's pop star headlines. First up, Steven Spielberg. We tease that the legendary director known for bringing Hollywood's most iconic stories and sweeping landscapes to life on the big screen recently took on a much more intimate project for the very first time in his career. Steven Spielberg directed a music video and he released the project yesterday with Mumford & Sons singer Marcus oh. Mumford. Wow. Now they shot the video earlier this month in a New York City high school gym. Spielberg's wife, Kate Capshaw, is credited as the producer, art director, and dolly grip. <laughs> <laughs> the song's called Cannibal. Let's take a look. Well, it's a razor thin line between genius and, I mean, that could be Us. a kid, right? On an iPhone, but yeah. that's Steven Spielberg. On a rolling show. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Music video. That song is fantastic, too. Right. Marcus Mumford so. opening up about this insane career milestone when he wrote on social media. When people get it, it blows my mind. Kate and Steven just got it, and I can't thank wow. them cool. enough. Cool. Okay, Pretty yeah. cool. Now an exclusive reveal in Popstart this morning. Today's launching a brand new digital cover series, and who better to help us reveal this debut edition than our inaugural cover star herself, Issa Is here. By the way, we haven't seen it. Let's drum roll, please. Oh, yes. Let's Let's debut the. There it is. I'm sorry. And it's in motion. It is so beautiful. Tell us about doing this cover shoot. Mm. This cover, like, I hadn't done. Uh, any photo shoots in like six months. So we ended, yeah. or probably longer. We ended mm -hmm. the show in December, and mm -hmm. this was such an amazing experience. We got to shoot it in a house outside in the beautiful mm. uh, LA weather. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you know, the photographer, shout out to her, she just killed Ooh. it. So Congrats on Insecure, by the way, is the show. If people don't know, it was fantastic. Thank it was you. a big yeah. Yeah. I, know. Yeah. Thank I was I was just telling her this morning, I've never seen anything like this. It almost reminded me, the, the writing is beautiful, the, the, the pictures, mm. and as you're scrolling and reading the art, Article, you see these videos and these and the photo shoot. It's, just, it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's cool. And well, you, thank y'all for making me your first cover. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. you open up really yeah. personally mm -hmm. in this. I mean, it, it, it's really unusual for you. What you, you know, Sylvia it? is one of those interviewers who just is like talking to your girlfriend. So mm -hmm. she caught me a couple moments, <laughs> giving a little too much. So, you know, a couple hours later, you're like, what did I yeah, say? Yeah, what did I say? I wasn't, I wasn't even like... drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to be joining us a little later on the fourth hour to talk yeah. some more. Issa. We're so happy that you're here. Congratulations. Wait, is this your first anniversary coming up of your marriage? You know, it is. It oh, is. Wow. Happy yeah, anniversary. Yeah. Thank year. you. Yeah. That and happy a billion, billion projects. Yeah. yeah, I made it. That's that's one project on end of it. <laughs> yeah, you can read the full story, by the way, today.com. And we have some more headlines for you, including Harry Styles. Remember when the golden singer rocked our plaza back in May? It was so much fun to have him here. Well, I hope you were taking diligent notes when he was here, because next spring, Texas State University is going to offer a course all about Harry Styles. That's right. Pretty soon, students at the university are going to be up late night talking about cramming for their Harry Styles finals. That's right. Professor Louis Dean Valencia is scheduled to introduce the new class exploring all things about Harry's music and the impact that he's had on the modern celebrity. 
on today's culture. So, Professor Louis, feel free to add this Pop Star Plus to your syllabus. And for what inspired this, the Texas State staffer told our Austin affiliate that he's been a big fan of Harry since his One Direction days. By the way, this continues that trend of pop stars leading the college course catalog. You might remember earlier this year, NYU launched a class about Taylor Swift. Look, this is one way to get kids to go to class, that's for sure. All right, next up, The Great British Bake Off. On your marks, get set, musical? Yeah, it's happening. The beloved UK baking show is headed to the stage. Bake Off, the musical, set to make its debut across the pond next week. Based on the famously friendly competition show, audiences will recognize the show's endlessly overheated great white tent. Plus, it's going to feature the types of Bake Off characters that we've all come to know and love, especially Savannah Guthrie. The surprisingly young superstar. There's the grandparent with decades of experience. Uh, how about the quirky baker who steps outside the lines? Now we just need to know if there's a song about soggy bottoms or a ballad for Paul Hollywood's coveted handshakes. All that you'll figure out. Bake Off, the musical scheduled to run from July 22nd. Again, this is over the pond to August 6th. And there you have it. The latest that you'll need to know, at least for today. Still to come, Ethan Hawke opens up about his new docuseries. It's really fascinating bringing recordings, actual recordings of icons Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward to life. Stay with us. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? Okay, Miss Lester. Hey, who's this? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. Ethan Hawke's latest project centers on the partnership between actors Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward that includes a star-studded list of actors who read transcripts of real interviews. Earlier today, Ethan stopped by Studio 1A to tell us all about it. Newman and Joanne Woodward were two Hollywood icons who shared a rare 50-year marriage. Their real-life story, just as captivating as the decades of performances in movies and TV and on Broadway. Well, Ethan Hawke. Ethan Hawke is the director behind the epic six-part series, The Last Movie Stars. It uses transcripts from lost Paul Newman interviews, and it illustrates the couple's incredible story. He cast some major A-listers to narrate the project, including George Clooney as Paul Newman. Take a listen. The glue that held Joanne and me together was that anything seemed possible. With all other people, some things were possible, but not everything. The promise of everything was there in the very beginning. Okay, uh, Ethan, welcome in. This project is so unique and epic, I feel like. You had a treasure trove of interviews that came from transcribed tapes. And basically, the Newman family, Newman's daughter, came to you and said, here's, here's my parents, please make something with all this. I know, it, it felt like a giant responsibility. I mean, I really was desperate to say no. Yeah. You, you know, because I knew how much work it would be and what a huge responsibility it would be. But I'm too much of a sucker. I'm, I'm a romantic, and I've, I grew up loving and adoring them. 
and I felt like people were kind of forgetting about what a miracle they were, what amazing artists they were. They lived substantive lives. They were good citizens um, mm -hmm. of the world and the community. They took care of each other. And it felt like a great moment to say, no, it can be done. It you know, can it be can done. be done. We can love each other. We can take care of each other. We can live good lives and we can have a great time while we're doing it. Well, we learned so many things in this. Number one, when everyone thinks of the two of them, we think of Paul Newman as the big star. But that wasn't how it started, was it? He was her, her boy toy boyfriend at the beginning. You know, I mean, she was she won the Oscar. She was heralded as, you know, Hollywood shining light. Three Faces of Eve blew the world away. Yeah. As you know, as a young woman. And it took him a little longer to find his stride. And, you know, mm -hmm. but shortly after they married, then the hustler came out and his career broke and then he blew up. You know what I love about this? Because we hear about the love story of Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. And you actually hear it in their own words. I mean, these are these are tapes. They'd done lots of audio tapes that were transcribed. Yeah, they were Newman was trying to write a memoir, and so uh -huh. he and Joanne hired their best friend, who's named Stuart Stern, who he wrote Rebel Without a Cause and a lot of great movies, and he was a really close family friend, and they did interviews with everybody in Paul and Joanne's life. And then Paul abandoned the memoir and abandoned the tapes, but I had, they, had they had them transcribed. So I got my actor friends to read some of these, uh, to reenact these interviews. Wow. And I built the, basically the spine of the documentary is all these lost interviews of their closest friends talking about them. I thought what was fascinating about the memoir that Paul Newman was thinking about was I didn't realize that Paul Newman had been married before. Yeah. yeah. That he had a wife and a family yeah. when he met Joanne Woodward. Yeah. I didn't I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean a lot of people don't know that their this beautiful marriage was born out of you know from scandal. Yeah. You know, they you know, but Paul's generation, it was a tough time. I mean, he came back from World War II. Yeah. Uh, he, as soon as he arrived, he went to do a play in Summerstock and fell madly in love. Yeah. And before he knew it, he had three kids with somebody he didn't know very well, and he still was, he was running a sporting goods store. And then it, that wasn't his true self. He wanted to be an actor, and he wanted to be an artist. He moved the young family to New York. Met Joanne backstage. They were both understudies, you know, around the corner from here on, wow. uh, on Broadway. And his life changed so dramatically. Uh, it, it was unrealistic to think he was going to, that it, you know, that yeah. something like this couldn't happen. Something could like happen. this would happen. Yeah. When you think about him, he's known for those piercing blue eyes and that sex appeal. But it's funny that. I, he didn't think he was so sexy. Like we learned that. He says that you know Joanne created that image, and I really? think that what he means is he respected her so much, and her confidence in him uh. kind of taught him who he could be. Her belief, and they did that for each other. You know, he directed her in many, many projects. He, I mean, they took turns nurturing each other. Um, you know, who was the rose and who was the gardener, uh -huh. so to speak. You know? Well, I thought it was fascinating, uh, Ethan, just how revealing Joanne was, revealing in those tapes about her reluctance to have children. She didn't think movie stars made good moms. Yeah. And she said the words aloud. I know, we're not allowed wow. to say things yeah. like that, even though we all think it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. But I felt if an actor was gonna make a movie about actors, that we needed to tell the truth. And I think that Joanne, when she talks about parenting that way, she loved her children and she loved being a mother to them. But I, my interpretation of her going all this is that she really wanted to remind young women what it was that they, they were giving up. That, that, you know, her life, she got strong-armed mm -hmm. into a certain lane. Yeah. You know, her whole dreams of being the movie star that Paul got to be were they were really pushed aside, and that's what society does to a lot of young women. She was warning them, hey, before you go gonzo in love, be, be, <laughs> make sure you know what you're doing. And I think the end of their life was fascinating, that she had dementia, he, he had cancer, and yet in the, in the end, you know, she, she was distant from him because she didn't, I guess, you know, she was in that different state, but she ended up going to him in the end, uh, as, as her their daughter described, and seeing him take his last breath. It's so beautiful. Um, it's, you know, death and illness is, is always strikes us as, as sad. And what this movie, what I really wanted to do is focus on their life. Yes. 
It's a life well lived, and their life together in their 70s was the best part time of their wow. life. She's running a theater company. Yeah. She's really her fully realized version of herself. They're giving away hundreds of millions of dollars. He's doing Color of Money, Verdict, Nobody's Fool, some of the best work yes. in his life. And when you think, you know, right around the corner from here was is the actor's studio. And <laughs> Paul Newman, Joanne Woodward were in class there with James Dean, Marlon Brando, Marilyn Crazy. Monroe. And when you look at their peers in their 70s yeah. were not yes. in full blossom the yeah. way Paul and Joanne were. Well, Ethan, this is an incredible project. It is unique. It's all by itself. You have George Clo Clooney, uh, Lara Linney, and so many others. Congratulations on this. We encourage people to check it out. Yeah, I'm grateful to all my friends for helping. I'm so grateful. Oh, thanks for having me on your show. Oh, you can check out all the episodes of The Last Movie Stars. It's streaming this Thursday on HBO Max. That's such a cool concept. Great to have Ethan here with us telling us all about it. You can catch The Last Movie Stars on HBO Max on July 21st. Coming up next, Ed Helms and the rest of the Rutherford Falls cast on how the show tackles representation. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. My name is Lester. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. From New Orleans, nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. Rutherford Falls chronicles the goings on in a small northeastern town that borders a Native American reservation. The show's been getting touted as a, being very breakthrough in its representation on camera and behind the scenes with six Native writers. And the cast spoke to us about why their storytelling is so important. Rutherford Falls, in a nutshell, is... It's a small northeastern town with some kind of uh, colonial pride that exists on the border of the fictional Minashanka Reservation. The communities interact with each other, and they work together, and they have conflicts as well. The show kind of dives into the politics behind whose land is whose and who founded the town. I think it is something where it's like there's a wonderful small town comedy, but within that there's incredible themes of revisionist history and uh, native joy and uh, reclaiming identity and redefining identity. Uh, it's a really, it, it, there's a lot of complex themes, uh, but that just gets delivered in a palatable, lighthearted, hilarious and heartfelt comedy. A bunch of years ago, Lawrence Rutherford wrote and signed a legally binding agreement with the Minnesota. That's why this town exists. That's why all of you exist. Okay, Lawrence Rutherford is our forefather. He's our Adam and Eve, our, our Tigris and Euphrates. And that statue, which sits on my family's land, commemorates all that he gave us. 
you don't get that, well, you're just an ungrateful boob. Yeah. I think in season one, we, you know, explored the Nathan character and this concept of his legacy. We kind of blow it up by the end of the of the season. And you also watch characters like Terry and Regan really level up and get what they've been sort of fighting for for many, many years. And so in season two, it's a real kind of fun exploration of what does it feel like when you're starting from scratch and you have to kind of build a legacy for yourself? And then also what happens when you do have it all and get what you want? And is that sometimes harder than, than having to start over again? Um, we really leaned into the ensemble. I feel like we really got to explore and find out how funny these characters are and different dynamics that we enjoyed and dynamics we hadn't tried yet. And so it's a real sort of, there's a lot of romance and a lot of silliness this year. And I'm just really excited for people to see it. I think that um, comedy is inviting. To generate laughter for people is a gift. I think also, you know, specifically for Native people and Native storylines, we have been relegated to drama historically in this industry. And so it's been actually very fun and easy to elevate us into a, a comedy space and to utilize the, the writing of other Native comedians and non-Native comedians. I always think of this quote from Judd Apatow where he said, when someone's laughing, it's the only time I'm sure that they don't hate me and so, or something like that. I might have butchered it a little bit, but it speaks to a greater beauty and truth about comedy and especially comedic storytelling, which is you can tell stories about awful characters or characters that make awful mistakes. And Nathan certainly is that and Regan is that mm -hmm. at times. And uh, and if but if you're keeping the audience laughing, then they're also kind of empathizing and they're also connecting and they're not hating that that character for making these mistakes. And that's, I think, a very powerful thing that that without articulating it that clearly, we have sort of we have strived for in making Rutherford Falls. One of the details that I love this season, I mean, the show in general is so great and it's, you know, it's it's Sierra uh, spearheading, obviously, but all of the, the writers, there's uh, six Native writers on the staff and all of them as well, like, are reaching out to their communities to bring in art from their various communities and just sort of connections that they have. As an Indigenous actor, you know, frankly, you know, as, a, as an actor of color, I think Hollywood positions us to be sort of, in a way, guardians of, of cultural authenticity. With Rutherford Falls, I was placed in a position where I didn't have to do that. The writing was authentic. The writing came from our communities. So that allowed me to sort of just really be a better actor, to be very clear. All the success, you know, that I've had, um, you know, as an actor being recognized for my work on season one came because uh, Sierra and the rest of the creators uh, were, were shouldering the load. Um, carrying things uh, that would allow Jana and myself and the other the other Indigenous actors to really um, just level up. Uh, so I'm I'm so grateful for that. I feel like when it comes to Native um, stories on television that's made by non-Native people, there's usually an element of like hold for applause, or it just feels like homework, and you're just like, oh god. And I we like we always were like let's avoid Ugh, kind of feeling, you know, at, at every turn. And, and so in our lives um, as Native storytellers, I find that often very complex things will happen to us and they'll be coupled with comedy. And I always was like, if we could just tell our story as we experience it, I think people will not only get a real view into our experience, but they'll also be very entertained and will find it funny. Once Native people are in on the joke, it's, it's a really wonderful experience for, for any viewer coming into the show. Well, it is important. That was awesome to hear from those folks. We should mention Rutherford Falls is available on Peacock, which is part of our parent company, NBC Universal. Still to come from our vault, Daniel Radcliffe at just 12. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today.
Several mean Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. My name is this. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. And welcome back. Daniel Radcliffe's 33rd birthday is this week, so we thought it would be a good idea to take a little journey back in time to the very start of Daniel's career. He spoke with us at Today during the release of the very first Harry Potter film when Daniel was just 12 years old. Hi, Dan. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Well, let's talk about the whirlwind your life has been recently. Yesterday was the premiere here in the Big Apple. A week before that was the London premiere. Red carpets, flashing lights, entertainment reporters. I mean, what was it like? It was pretty scary, but it was... It was pretty scary, but it was really good fun. And everybody there, like Chris Columbus, he was there and he just makes you feel like really at ease. Was it exciting though, just oh, to yeah. kind of finally, I mean, this was the product of n nine long months of very hard work, frankly, by you and the rest of the cast and everybody involved in the picture. So it must have been just wonderful to kind yeah. of have the weight off your shoulders and be able to sort of have a good time. It was, yeah, it was fun. but. I, I was quite nervous, but it was it was very cool. You were nervous really about enjoyed. how the movie would be received, or just um, all the attention. I I was kind of just nervous about like seeing all the um, photographers and everything like that. I was kind of nervous about that. Yeah, the paparazzi yeah. that can be a little overwhelming. I'm sure, especially for someone who's 11 years old. You're still 11, um, or 12. Be 12. When did 12. you turn 12? Uh, July 23rd. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's my daughter's birthday. Happy birthday. Mm. Anyway, let's go back because I know that at first. I feel it right now, Dan, as you must understand, I feel like the official Harry Potter historian slash Warner Brothers flack. But having said that, I know all the, the whole story and I know your backstory, which was there two months before shooting, there was no Harry Potter. Thousands of kids had auditioned. And the director, Chris Columbus, said, get me that kid from David Copperfield, right? Tell me how they discovered you and why they went after you uh, so enthusiastically to play Harry Potter. I have no idea. Well, obviously, they, yeah. they're pretty captivated by your performance in David Copperfield. Um, I really don't know why they chose me, but I'm glad they did. And so, at first, your yeah. parents weren't that enthusiastic, right? Um, they only had one concern, and that was because um, I've been up for David Copperfield, and I've been up for, been up for Taylor of Panama, and on both of those, I, I kind of had a tendency to get my hopes up and they knew that there were thousands of boys going up for the part so they didn't want me to get my hopes up and then be disappointed so they were just protecting me. And they were though, once you did get the part, they were pretty excited as yeah. you were too. We were. And when you, I know that when you were first tapped <laughs> to play <laughs> Harry Potter, uh, you hadn't read the books. But after you got the role, you quickly devoured them and fell in yeah. love with them like so many other oh, kids. Amazing. What was it about the books that you found so great? I think... I think it was the fact that I think not only myself, but I think everybody can relate to Harry in some way. And I think as well, it's the idea of magic when magic kind of comes to life there's so much opportunity for absolutely anything to happen so and I think I kind of like to read about what could happen if magic really came to life. And Harry Potter in a way is sort of the ultimate underdog I mean you really mm -hmm. push for him because he his lot in life is pretty tough uh, in fact we have a clip uh, this is where Harry Potter we see he has a very sad life living under the stairs in his mean aunt and uncle's house the Dursleys <laughs> they sound mean the Dursleys they mean, don't they, they? Yeah. and he starts to realize he has special wizard powers let's take a quick look at a clip excuse me could, could you tell me how to how to get onto the platform? <laughs> Not to worry, dear. It's Ron's first time to Hogwarts as well. Now, all you've got to do is walk straight at the wall 
between platforms nine and ten. Best do it at a bit of a run with you, girls. Good luck. Hogwarts Express. That's not the Dursleys at all, Dan. I'm so sorry. Anyway, you did a great job as Harry Potter. I know you're already shooting the second film. Yeah. And the first one opens this Friday. Thanks so much for coming by. Great to see you Thank again, you. Dan. We appreciate it. And a happy early birthday to you, Mr. Radcliffe. And there you have another Pop Star Plus comes to an end. We hope you'll join us again tomorrow. We're going to have more things that you're going to need to know. Until then, have a great day. See you soon. Not from you. <laughs> How are you? Good, nice to see you. I mean, this day and this garden are just for you. How beautiful is it up here? Incredible. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me on. Let's talk Legos. Legos. <laughs> Legos. <laughs> Was that hello, like, sounded deep enough for it to be bell and button talk, or not really? You have to kind of bring it down from here. OK. You have to hello. go. Hello. No, 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 not <laughs> your hand. Hello. hello. Then you go up high. Oh, OK. You start low and go up. Hello. High. Yeah. No. Hey! Hello! 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 What's that? Oh, it's just a stupid thing. Well, I'm sure it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about me, is it? No! Not at all! <laughs> no, me! All right. You know this girl, Claire, I'm seeing? Yeah. Well, he and I started joking that when she falls asleep, her stomach stays awake all night and talks to me. <laughs> How's he talking? Well, the belly button's like a mouth. I'm bored. <laughs> OK, so you've played a lot of different Jerry's. Do you know what I mean? You've had the big puffy sleeve Jerry. Yes, I, on the Today Show. Yes. We debuted the puffy shirt on the Today Show with Brian Gumbel. That is a very, very unusual shirt you have on. <laughs> you know, yeah. They're all kind of, kind of puffed up. Yeah, it's a puffy shirt. <laughs> you look kind of like a pirate. <laughs> yeah, like a pirate. Anyway, uh, you know, we're hoping to um, raise enough money with the you know, you know, with this. <laughs> look, I'm sorry. It is just a very unusual shirt. It could be kind of a whole new look for you. You know, you could put a, a patch over an eye. You could kind of like be the pirate comedian. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You yeah. had some iconic looks. Yeah. What made you think, okay, it's time naturally to be a Lego Jerry? Well, who doesn't want to be a Lego? It's Lego Seinfeld. He's blocky. He's stoppy. He has sea hands. What are we selling here? <laughs> Lego, the reason people love Lego is because they it clicks together. And once it clicks, it fits. It's tight. And it makes sense. Yes. And the world doesn't make sense. But Lego, you can, you can order the universe with Lego. You can make sense of something. Yeah. If you follow the instructions and you complete the model, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I have three little kids. Have you ever stepped on a Lego in the middle of the night? It's painful, yeah. It's not a great thing. You're no. right that they make sense. There's there's moments where you want to throw them, though. Yeah. Does that, is fun that, to throw, too. Is that sort of makes is that sort of you? You know, they're, they're like, Jerry, and you make sense, but there's moments where you're like, no, that doesn't I've work. never stepped on a Lego, <laughs> but that does seem like a killer. Okay. In this short, you say, but I don't want to be a Lego. <laughs> right. But you actually wanted to be a Lego. You, this was I your did, idea. yeah. How, what was the genesis? Uh, the genesis was Lego made a model of my TV show set, and Netflix bought the TV show and wanted to do a promo, and I went, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Why can't I be a Lego? <laughs> and, then I, and then I really wanted to do the line again. I don't want to be a pirate. But I, yeah, but I don't want to be a Lego. But I don't want to be a Lego. I know. I, somehow that that is a hard octave to match. You know, there's a whininess to that that's really hard to do. It's it, these are some of the little subtle things of comedy that are very important. So, what did your wife and kids think when you told them you were turning into 
They loved it. I got the idea from my son, who was wanted to build his last Lego. He's 16. He, thinks, he said, you know, I think I got one more Lego <laughs> left in me. One more. I go, why don't you do the set from my TV show? We were walking along, and I went, oh, that's the promo. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make Netflix shrink me down. <laughs> shrink you down and pour actual Lego cereal yes. into your mouth. There, you, the set is incredible. It's exactly like it's your amazing. set. Tell me some of the details you love. I, I love the couch, and I love the refrigerator, and the stove. This phone is and I love wearing the costume. Some of those bits, like, you know, when I skate out in the yes. end, that took an hour and a half oh. of moving an inch at a time. And when I sit down on the couch, that took an hour and a half. The stop motion is not done with humans. Yeah. It's done with props. You know, the last person to do it was Peter Gabriel Sledgehammer. Oh, really? Yes. Humans don't do stop motion. We do it with toys and props. <laughs> you don't ask a person to do this. And now this. And now this, you know. But the fact that, so first of all, somebody told me about this, and I thought, like, no, no, he, Jerry Seinfeld's not becoming a Lego. <laughs> and then they told me you shot it last week. Yeah, last week. So how much fun was it? There was a lot of laughter. It was insane. <laughs> we, it was just this crazy, everybody. We had to hire an animation company to do the stop motion because i wanted it to be stop motion and then to build that set that was all custom made out of foam and then paint and then the plastic finish to make it shiny i mean we worked so hard on it well it was so much fun i bet it was yeah so the amazing brian cranston who is a tony winner an emmy winner yeah oscar nominated yeah. you call him on the phone and you're like hey you want to be a lego He's not a well, Lego. Well, he's an announcer. He's an announcer. Coming this fall to Netflix. 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 Net, 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 net. Seinfeld. 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 You call him on the phone and say, want to be in a Lego short? Yeah. And his response was? Love to. He says, I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> but I trust you. That's what he said. Did you notice the little dentist chair at the end? I sure did. That's was the that little, a nod uh, to him? I think that's a cookie, what we call a cookie. <laughs> okay, I thought maybe that would have been a stranger conversation, but it was just pretty basic. Want to be in a Lego short? Let's if, do it. If you're a comedy person, which Brian is, even though he's done a lot of yes. drama, and someone gives you a crazy idea, you go, yeah, that sounds crazy. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Who mean Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time? You were still in Kiev. Could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Ali Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. So the last couple years, people have been at home on their couches. Right. Is this, is there like a lot of creativity spurring up in you? Is that why things like this are happening or not really? Maybe. I didn't think about that, but maybe. I, I personally have a, a feel like I really need to have some fun. I really need to make fun things for people. Yeah. That's why I wanted to do this. I go, this is just fun and silly. And I don't see enough of that. Yeah. I like that. It, does, it will make people laugh for yeah. sure. So Netflix has picked up all of these episodes. Yes. Do you think the world's ready? 
I don't know. <laughs> they weren't when we started back in 89, that's for sure. It took a number of years before people said, what are, what are they talking about? How do they talk? I know that's kind of interesting. So it didn't catch on right away? No, it took four years. The first four years of the show, it was poorly received, very poorly received. That's forgotten now. Yeah. Yeah. But and so how did you all have the patience just to wait it through? Well, um, in those days on television, if you got a good demo, yeah. uh, the advertisers wanted to be on your show. So even though we were not good, <laughs> we got a certain audience that was buying like BMWs. So that kept us on the air. Um, I Tell me about being a Lego, transforming. It did not look comfortable, I have to tell you. It was okay. I, I was fine with it. I just wanted to be it so bad. <laughs> I wanted to be in the toy. Seems like, you know, so if, it you did bought, it... if you bought that toy yeah, and you could get me shrunk yes. down in it, wouldn't that be the ultimate? I'd be very into having you as a Lego, <laughs> yeah. but I have to tell you, I, I was worried about you because it looked like oh. there was a little bit of a wedgie in this area. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, there's lots of... Just issues. between you and me, we want... There, was there a little issues, wedgie? A lot of issues below the waist. It looks yeah. like it. Yeah. I mean, that, that round area. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Um, I loved Netflix's press release. It was brilliant. Did you read it? The new show thing? Yeah. Yeah. It said Netflix will launch 180 episodes of a situational comedy called Seinfeld created by rising New York comedian Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David, who wrote for Saturday Night Live for a single season. That's right. So how did you feel about, I mean, the fact that they would take a chance on a young New Yorker just like you, did that feel good? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Did. And to make that many shows, not knowing if anyone was gonna like it, it was quite a gamble. It really yeah. was, thank you, Netflix. Yeah. Sitting here with this beautiful view in Rockefeller Center, New York's been through a lot. Yes. You wrote a really beautiful article that I feel like everybody posted online. And um, what does it feel like to be here on this day, beautiful fall day in a city that you love so much? I am uh, humbly uh, proud of uh, that I stuck up for my town. Yeah. I, I just love this town. Yeah. And you know, I, I know, I grew up you know, all around here. So you, you know the people, you know what they're made of. You know, you, you're, not, you're not getting rid of this. There is nothing like this anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. There's a resilience. To yes, it, right? yes. And on a day like this, there's nowhere better to be. No, no. It has a, a New York on a beautiful day is really magical. It really is. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I'm just wondering, as a Lego, could could Elaine do her dance? Like, what would that look like? There'd be like? a lot of clicking, and yeah. clacking. Kind yeah. of like in in the knee area. Yeah, the, some of the plastic might crack. Now, does a Lego have a belly button? No. No, so, just mean, shirt buttons. How would you talk from your belly button? That'd be a really hard thing. Well, we're not going to do the whole series. I have, <laughs> okay, I have to tell not. you the truth. <laughs> it was really just a joke. Oh, you're not do I no. thought you were doing the whole series as a Lego. Yeah, that's kind of uh, the way it looks. But no, we couldn't do it. <laughs> Too expensive, right? Yeah, yeah. These days. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on yes. this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now.
good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The biggest grievance of 2021 so far. And you don't have to have one if you don't want one. But oh, do I've got one? tons. <laughs> um, sounds like a plan. That's because it is a plan. That's what the sound was. Just tell me what time you want to meet. Stop saying the thing sounds like a plan. <laughs> you know what? Actually, Hoda and I, are, and, and actually Savannah, we're in a fight over the word literally because we think oh, it's overused. Way overused. Are you on my side? Totally. They're like, totally well, literally, go too, it's, the literally, it's freezing out here. I'm yeah. like, no, it's just cold. It's just freezing. If it was literally freezing, yeah. you would have frostbite. That's right. Okay, so you want to tell Hoda that you're on my side? I'm on Jenna's side, Hoda. Stop with the literally. Thank you. It's not a book <laughs> to begin with. Yeah, if we want to talk literal, yeah. let's go to talk Jane Austen. You yeah. know what I mean? You go away from New York for a couple months. What's the first thing you do when you come back? Just walk. A walk in New York is like reading a novel. The, you see snippets of, you know, I love that people yap on the phone out loud. I love hearing half a conversation. I you do know? too. I, it's fun, right? I yeah. don't find it annoying. No, I, really I don't like find it. it annoying. In fact, when we go to restaurants, I'm like, honey, they're getting divorced. He's like, can you pay attention to me? Yeah. It's hard not to. Musical artist that you listen to that would surprise some people. Do you like music? I love music. That would surprise some people. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it would surprise them. I really love John Denver. That's not a surprise. I, I love uh, America. I love the band America. I, and I really love uh, Malo, who they had a song called Suavecito, which is my favorite song. <laughs> is it really? Suavecito. Can you sing a little bit of Suavecito mm. to me? La, 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 <laughs> la, la, la. Sound familiar? <laughs> You know this song, Jenna, you know Suave this song. Suavecito? You know Suavecito. You don't know that you know it. It's one of the greatest Latin Suavecito. Song. Yeah. Is that it? No. I'm thinking Despac Despacito. It's not Despacito. Do you know Despacito by yes. the Bieber? Despacito, no, no. es Suavecito. <laughs> okay. okay. It's um, diferente. So I felt like I needed to say, hello. Is that better? Right. No. Is it what? Was that better? Hello. Hello. Okay. Is that, what's the number one Seinfeld line that people yell at you when you're walking the streets? Um, they yell, um, where's Kramer a lot. I don't know why I'm expected to be with him at all times. They yell, where's Kramer? What do you say? I go, he's not real. <laughs> he's not real. Um, uh, this is sort of a strange one, but last picture you took on your iPhone. I hope it, it, only if it's in a, if it's not appropriate. It's always, of course, I don't do anything okay. not appropriate. Okay, the good. last picture I took, well, it's a it's a small story. Okay, we've got the time as long okay. as you do. I like, I like, uh, I watch a lot of YouTube. I like funny uh, pet stuff. Yeah. And I saw I you do. a bulldog <laughs> riding a skateboard. Uh, and it was so cute, and I was so fascinated, and I just thought that they just showed how this bulldog, he just loves his skateboard, he loves it, and I go, that, that's, that explains so much of life right there. He just, he just loves it. And there's no reason why. No one will ever understand why. He loves that skateboard. So later on that day, I was walking from 69th in New York to Columbus and 81st, and as I was getting up to Columbus on 81st, I saw a bulldog no. and a woman, same day, a woman carrying his skateboard. Was it the same bulldog? No. And did you take a picture yes. of it? Yes. And did you send it to your wife? No. Okay. I thought maybe you'd share it. I know she likes funny pet I videos I told the too. story. The picture wasn't great. <laughs> a little blurry. Yeah, but it was, 
Amazing. So I just have to go back to the fact that you like funny pet videos. Do you find comfort in them, humor, what is it? I don't, uh, I don't really have a pet. I don't, I know. You we, do have a pet, I you know, have Javier. It's, I, I'm not, it's not, he and I have no real relationship. Wait, that's, your wife is gonna take real offense to this. No, it's her thing. You don't like cats? They're okay. <laughs> but Javier is marrying my sister's cat. That's fine. You're not going to be at the wedding? I guess I will. <laughs> you don't really like a cat. I, I like that my wife enjoys it. OK. And when he gets lost, I go looking for him. Well, that, Javier does not go outside on the streets of New York, does he? No, but out, we have a house on Long okay. Island, and sometimes he will escape. OK, well, that's nice. So you yeah. do secretly love the cat? OK, secretly. OK, I thought Let's so. keep it a secret. All right, don't tell anybody. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Excuse me, uh, I think you forgot my bread. Bread, two dollars extra. Two dollars, but everyone in front of me got free bread. You want bread? Yes, please. Three dollars! <laughs> what? No soup for you! You want bread? Three dollars! No soup for you! How would I describe the soup Nazi? Is I just thought he was a very militant food vendor who, who didn't take crap from anybody and uh, ruled his, his soup station with an iron fist. And I, I even went into the original audition in an army uniform with a beret, so I looked like uh, Saddam Hussein. <laughs> You're pushing your luck, little man. Sheila! Hey! Uh-oh. What is this? You're kissing in my line? Nobody kisses in my line! My favorite line is the kissing line, and uh, I was doing a, a thing for Sony once called the Seinfeld Food Truck, where we were going to different locations, and for two hours people would line up and get treats. And, uh, I very seldom get the chance to say that line, and there was one couple in Albuquerque, New Mexico, who were brave enough to stand there and start making out in front of me, and I finally got to say, like, you're kissing in my line? Nobody kisses in my line! So the main thing is to keep the line moving. I say, so you hold out your money, speak your soup in a loud, clear voice, step to the left and receive. So right. The step to the left part, it, it's, it's been made fun of so often, I've had people come up to me and, like, down like that and step to the left and uh, going to the actual real soup stand I finally found out that the reason you step to the left is the menu board is to your right so if you order and stay there no one else could see the menu so there actually is method to the madness I actually say no soup for you a lot these days but uh, in the first like three years after the episode I refused to say it I wouldn't say it for anybody I, when I was nominated for the Emmy, I had interviews with a, a few big TV shows and I refused to say it for them because I just thought I'd sound like a bad water cooler impression of myself out of context. And then when we shot the finale, um, the very first scene we shot was actually a silent scene at this bed and breakfast where I take Poppy's soup bowl away from him because he motions that he wants salt and pepper. And 
uh, Jerry and Larry David decided that I should say No Soup For You out loud, even though you weren't going to hear it in the show, which absolutely terrorized me. But I said it, and as we walked away from that scene, Larry David walked over to me. He goes, hey, man, you say it the same way you said it three years ago. So ever since then, it's like a knee jerk. There was um, a lady named Marcia who was in the extra pool. And they had built the soup stand a little longer than they planned. So for me to go to the cash register and back to serve the soup was killing the timing of the lines. It was just taking too long. So they called this girl out from the extra pool because she looked like she would be working in, in my stand. And uh, her name was Marcia. And she, at a moment's notice, did that thing where she pulls the bag away from George and hands him the money back. It actually got uh, more laughs than anything I did. And to this day, when I see that scene over and over again, I laugh at her timing. The guy who runs a place is a little temperamental, especially about the ordering procedure. He's secretly referred to as the soup Nazi. <laughs> Working with that cast was just amazing. Jason Alexander was calling me Lat, which is the New York shortening of Larry. There's Lawrence, Larry, Lat, but that's New York. And he was calling me that within about an hour of me being on the set. Um, Julia was incredible because if I made her laugh, she would totally break up and she'd grab my hand and go, you're so funny. So they were so welcoming. But the most amazing story to me is Jerry himself because um, I've dealt with a lot of producers and directors in the world of theater, TV, film, everything. I've done some directing myself and I know what that's like. But I've never worked with um, a, a director and producer who had less ego than Jerry Seinfeld. Medium crab bisque. When I did the callback, I did the six scenes that the Soup Nazi has, and he laughed a lot. It was great. It was, he was laughing too much, actually. And then he had me do it again, and he said, you know, I don't understand why the character is so mean. Could you, you know, kind of do it again and give it some of this, be a little nicer sometimes, which I did horribly. I don't think he laughed once. And I thought for sure that was, you know, the death nail about the character. I wasn't going to get it. But I did get it, and as soon as I walked onto the soundstage, Jerry B. lined over to me and he said, you know what, man, forget about the direction I gave you, just do what you did when you walked in, the meaner the funnier, I guess. And I was just astounded by his lack of wanting to be right, which almost every other director and producer uh, has. I could go a long time without being recognized, but every once in a while, somebody will say to me, you know, has anybody ever told you you look like the soup Nazi from Seinfeld? And depending on if I have time to talk about it, you know, because sometimes I, like I'm in a rush or something, so I'll just say like, yeah, I get that a lot. And other times, you know, I, I get to go like, yeah, I was him. You know, and it's, it's always fun because Seinfeld fans uh, range from 13 years old to, to 83 years old, you know. A couple of times I've been somewhere, like on the subway, or somewhere where it's crowded and people can't really see me. And I will actually hear somebody say to somebody else, you know, no soup for you. And I'm, I'm actually like, you know, 10 people away and they don't even know that I'm there, but I hear people say it. I actually wrote a book called Confessions of a Soup Nazi, an adventure in acting and cooking, uh, which is part cookbook, part memoirs of, you know, 30, 40 years of being an actor. But the reason I wrote it is because I get so many people that come up to me and they go, you know, you were so great on Seinfeld. Did you ever do any other acting after that? So, uh, I, but I get all kinds of stuff. I get people that, that think I'm really Al Yegane and that's, you know, I, I was at your soup stand. I visited New York and I was at your soup stand and, you know, it was closed. When do you plan on reopening? And, I have so much fun with going, like, I'm, I'm an actor. It's not my soup stand. It's, you know. The funniest thing about how my life has changed after Seinfeld is I had no idea that the life I had was gone forever. Not a moment goes by in my life where it doesn't have something to do with having been the soup Nazi. Really, an hour goes by and something happens where that takes over my life again. So it's, it's a whole new existence.
where do I think the Soup Nazi would be now? Well, then I have to pitch my idea for a spinoff because, see, I, I see a food court in Manhattan where the Soup Nazi, Babu, and Poppy are all in a row with their prospective little stands and Jackie Childs comes in there every day for lunch and we vie for his business, of course. You know, whatever the storylines are about, uh, or whatever actually the events that happen in every episode, it really boils down to the way people treat each other. You know, they didn't treat people very well. You gotta admit that. I know people loved, you know, Jerry, George, Elaine, and Kramer, but they were horrible. They treated people badly, and they always got their comeuppance for treating people badly. So. I guess in the end, that's such a generational and universal, never-ending idea is you treat people a certain way and you get back the way, you know, it's like the golden rule, you know, you get back what you give. And that's really what the show is about in the end. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crap. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomping and grind of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty, and savory, all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you got to think blue crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices, and you just start whacking that bad boy. You can get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Mm. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region, but here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. So good to see you. How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. Pardon me. I've. I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. 
You can get another five fans and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for an autograph, they ask her for a picture, they ask her to hold their babies. You know, it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back? Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh -huh. There, it's like walking to somebody's home. That's they're they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel. Oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people. We were here 20 years. It's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location. Founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886, started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine, along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. A tray like that is about, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking, and I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you? Did you think you were going to end up here? You were going to be doing this? No, no. But it was hard to get away from, and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see see it ending with my parents. So the pandemic hit. Yes. You really had to step up. My father called me, and I said, "Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know that we we don't know anything about this this virus and and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't." And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, Mom and Dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's which honest good, truth. Which could be a good or a bad. <laughs> that's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so... I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm going to say it's been around 33, 34 years. And I started in the 79, uh, a week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities. But you love each other, and it always works. You know, it always works well. It's, what's really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, 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 you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a few of them, you know? Just a few. While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Thank you. So excited to have this. And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created her recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So, besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's Crab Cake recipe? Oh, man, I sleep I with her, she won't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so, some people use breadcrumbs, you use crushed broken up salty. Broken salty, yes. 
and not not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together, right. nothing more. That's right. And the Why big I... ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. Oh boy. Oh. It was just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now, this is a legacy. Now, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up. The generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Local media Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. You were still in Kiev. Could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well, he grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There was more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole east coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, 
forge their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise is essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lord, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. How they bite in the day? This morning it looked pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do and have nobody tell you, go get me this or go get me that. 75-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, now I'll be 15, and I've been at it ever since. Right now, now I'm going down the line, and I, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. Not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got all the jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black watermen, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it'll be no chance for more black watermen. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise and educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. And it, it, it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up-and-coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. 
Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody good, and that's it! It's a can't-miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Back in Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. So I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. I'm an artist at heart. So uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, crab, crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in D.C., so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side, and pretty much I've um, always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food, so learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watched my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then, the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you had people standing in line hundreds of people <laughs> on the block and in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was, it was just may, it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Hi. Natasha. My big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, that uh, people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know. Coming up, I'm going to grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crap. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? 
Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. Well, I know I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. Were you able to add a little? Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix a dish, well, "What did you put in this? How did you do? How did you do this?" And I would tell him, I said, you don't have to follow to the letter, you know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius! The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right. Patience ready. So, how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first, what you want to do is say we have some uh, Maryland jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So, for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but uh -huh. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just gotta see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So, Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> This sauce particular is our, our crab sauce mix. So we're gonna drizzle a little bit at a time. Cause I don't wanna put too much, right. just enough to uh, bind. You got enough fowl? Yep, I think I'll have enough. She's, she's stay by me, I like this. <laughs> I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about, you know, when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why, why, why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant? The most popular. Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a a bar more favorite and you know make it handheld and on on the go. Uh -huh. You know, it's throwing your hand. Kind of and eat. Food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's it's very popular. Other than the taste as well. Right. Well, exactly. You know. <laughs> Yeah, because that's, that's You can take taste. it with you, but if it's not right, tasty, right, exactly. uh, come back for it. Yeah, so what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab. It's around like a yeah, quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. We're going to sit in the middle. Is that too yeah. much? Yeah, mm -hmm. we want to take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, we want to put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's perfect right there. Right, perfect, sorry. perfect. <laughs> And we're gonna Just literally fold them up envelope style. What is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, things like that, mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is an opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And mm -hmm. You know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Hey, yeah. is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! I faster than I did. Wow! <laughs> wow! That natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're going get, to get the deep fryer up here and fry these yeah. bad boys up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Woo! You had to describe the heart of your cuisine. What is it, and, and how does Baltimore uh, kind of part of that? Pretty much my, my story, and I think that connects very well to our Baltimore, you know, because, you know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life, and I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about that, and it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore, and they, they watched my journey through the years, and I feel like that's that's really like the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure and the inside. Crisp around the edges and then things like that, so that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't uh -huh. fry on one particular side too much, and I just want to even fry. Ooh. 
nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made. And this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet. It has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, and that's the piece. Yes, <laughs> yes. Crab cake egg roll. Yes. Here we go. Wow. Chef Hawk, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake, tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls, and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family. Those record-setting and unrelenting temperatures now stretching from California all the way to New Hampshire. Feels like a furnace. <laughs> More than 200 million Americans being forced to find relief wherever they